the following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. Okay, thank you. Good morning all, welcome everybody. So um, this dark matter session will mainly focus on uh, different experimental techniques. So um, we have a lot of exciting talk. There will be 20 minute talk, a five minute question. Question, the time for the question might not be enough. That's why we have some speaker have prepared some private room session that will be at the end of the talk. Coffee break. Uh, are meant to discuss if you if you wish. The full conference is um, uh, recorded, but coffee break are not. Um, we will post the recording. There are as well the um, the mattermost uh, chat if you want to send question and and so on. For question, we usually use raise hand on the uh, on the Zoom, or you can write your question. If you if you can't speak, you can write your question in the in the chat, and we'll uh, and we'll do the question for you. Uh, please unmute yourself uh, if you are not talking, and let's uh, let's move ahead. So this is pretty much all the technical details. So the first speaker of today is Yuri Fiaschi from uh, Münster University. And he's going to talk about MEV neutrino dark matter, relic density, lepton flavor violation, and electron recoil. So, Yuri, okay. so we will keep the video on and I will annotate uh, when, when you have uh, two minutes left over the 20 minutes. Okay, okay. I think you can all see the screen. Yeah. Uh, That's perfect. Fine, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for, at uh, first I really want to thank the organizer and the chairs for uh, setting up this. Uh, virtual conference, which I, I can only imagine how much effort you needed to, to organize such an event. So really, thank you. Um, okay, I'm just going to talk today. This is the topic of my of my talk, MEV neutrino dark matter. And I will focus on uh, various uh, observables uh, from astrophysical, uh, collider, um, and so on. So these are the topics of the talk. I will introduce the, the model that we will analyze that is a variant of the, of the SLIM model, just going through some motivations and the phenomenology of this model. Um, I we will see uh, what are the effect of uh, experimental constraints uh, on the parameter space of the model, uh, constraints from uh, all the various kind of experiments, collider, uh, cosmological observation, neutrinos experiment, lepton flavor violation, etc. And uh, lastly, I will also comment on the possibility of constraining the model uh, using a novel techniques based on electron recoil in direct detection experiment, namely the Xenor one ton experiments. And then I will conclude. So uh, very quickly going through motivations. Well, there is not much a need to motivate uh, why are we studying dark matter? There are several evidences for the presence of this elusive particle. Uh, we have gravitation, uh, gravitational lensing, the rotation curves of, of galaxies, and observations from Planck satellite and uh, WMAP and Kobe before that. Uh, in the end, we are able to set uh, some to, to, to measure the abundance of, of this uh, dark matter particle in the universe, which constitutes about 26% uh, of the uh, energy content of the universe. Another BSM physics evidence that we have uh, is related to the existence of neutrino masses, of small neutrino masses. Okay, so from um, oscill oscillation, we, we, we measured the um, oscillations of uh, eigenstates of, uh, of neutrinos, and we can only um, and we, we can interpret this uh, this observation by giving a small mass to the neutrinos 
such that they would os oscillate between the uh, mass uh, between the uh, mass eigenstates in their interaction uh, basis. Um, these two evidence for BSM physics uh, can be uh, addressed together by this class of models that, is called, that are called minimal models. So these minimal models, they introduce uh, a minimal amount uh, of, of BSM fields. Uh, namely, they are classified uh, adding less than four scalar or fermion uh, multiplets, uh, which can be either SU3 color singlets, SU2 singlets, doubles, triplets, and so on. Uh, generally, also an additional Z2 symmetry is introduced to stabilize the lightest uh, Z2 odd particle, which plays the role of, uh, of the dark matter candidate. And in these minimal models, it's very interesting that the two sectors, the dark sector and the neutrino sectors, are connected together. So the uh, neutrino masses are realized uh, radiatively uh, through the new interaction that, are, uh, that appear uh, once the uh, dark sector is introduced. And there are several examples of this kind of models that have been studied in the past. The most famous uh, probably is the scotogenic model, uh, but there are also some others uh, that you can see uh, here, uh, listed here. So the first question is why do we want to study uh, dark, uh, dark matter, in, especially particularly in this model, we will see that we will uh, naturally end up with a very light dark matter of the order of the uh, MEV. Um, while generally uh, GV to TV dark matter is, um, is considered in order to explain uh, relic density and uh, astrophysical observation, there, is also, uh, there are also strong motivations to study also uh, the MEV, uh, much lighter dark matter, so around the MEV scale. Um, mainly this, uh, um, with this choice, we can address some uh, um, astrophysical problems which are missing satellites galaxies the too big to fail problem and the core problem for uh, inner dark matter density profiles that are listed here and you can see uh, here what they are related to exactly. Uh, so what we do in this, um, what we did in our work is to consider this uh, SLIM model, uh, which stands for scalar as light as MeV. And in this model, the, the, the matter content of the standard model is um, is augmented by uh, adding one uh, complex scalar singlet. Uh, this is a, a slight variation on the original SLIM model. The original SLIM model actually considered only um, um, a real scalar singlet, while in this, uh, in, in our uh, work, we choose uh, a complex scalar singlet. And we will see later why uh, the, the reason of this choice. Then we also add two uh, singlet right-handed neutrinos uh, that, yeah, this will play the role uh, of right-handed neutrinos that uh, have this uh, twofold, um, uh, this twofold uh, purpose. Uh, the first one is to, uh, the, so the lightest will be of the order of MEV and will be our dark matter candidate. And the two generations are necessary in order to uh, generate radiatively the neutrino masses. So this right-handed neutrino will uh, both provide a dark matter candidate and will also generate uh, neutrino masses radiatively. And on top of that, we also add one complex scalar doublet in order to restore uh, symmetry at uh, high energies. This is the Lagrangian of the model. Uh, some terms are highlighted, namely we have in red the right-handed Majorana neutrinos. As we said, these uh, they are introduced uh, uh, for this twofold purpose. Then we have this blue, this term that is underlined in blue color. This term is um, a, this term is introduced to softly uh, break the U1 symmetry into a Z2 symmetry, uh, which means that basically this parameter M4 has to be small. And this, again, the Z2 symmetry eventually will be used to stabilize the, um, the lightest uh, Z2 odd particle, which will be our dark matter candidate. Uh, lastly, uh, this term that is underlined in green will be very interesting for the phenomenology of the model because it is telling us that the model is mostly leptophilic, which means that we have a coupling between uh, the new uh, introduced particles uh, the, the right-handed neutrinos and the uh, complex doublet. 
uh, these are coupled to the standard model uh, leptons. So uh, both the, the coupling with neutrinos will be responsible for generating the masses radiatively, while the coupling to the charged um, leptons will be responsible to some other uh, interesting uh, observable observations like the lepton flavor violation, lepton flavor violating processes. Okay, um, in this model, uh, after electrons weak symmetry breaking, we have uh, the, the, the scalar, the charged, uh, the new charged scalar ma uh, particles acquire mass, uh, while the neutral components of the doublet and the single and the singlet they mix together, and the uh, mass eigenstate can be written as shown here. And you can see that there's mass differences can be uh, fine-tuned to be small. Uh, we parameterize this uh, small splitting by this parameter epsilon. And if we choose this epsilon uh, small enough, uh, we, can, we will be able to explore uh, MEV, uh, MEV range for the masses of, the, uh, of both the lightest um, new scalar particle and the uh, right-handed neutrinos, which will be the dark matter. Um, now I will move to the uh, applying to impose the experimental constraints on the parameter space of the model. Um, namely, so we have various um, several constraints from the Higgs potential. For example, they uh, these constraints they fix. Uh, the couplings uh, lambda four and lambda five, and together with and also the lambda six, they these are um, related to uh, the mass that uh, of the new charged particles, and this mass is strongly constrained by um, collider measurements on on Higgs on the branching ratio of Higgs into two photons. Indeed, the new uh, charged scalar particles. They will enter in the uh, decay of the Higgs into two photon in the loop. So, uh, from the measurements on the branching ratio of Higgs into two photons, and also on other constraints from from LEP, which set the masses of the scalar particles of these uh, BSM scalar particles above a certain threshold, which, if I remember correctly, is above is about uh, 95 GV or so. Uh, so, with all these constraints, uh, we um, we are able to bound the uh, parameters uh, lambda four and lambda five that we set to about zero point one. So, with this choice, uh, the Higgs sector and and the masses of the charged particles uh, are satisfies the experimental bounds. Uh, cosmological constraints instead uh, require first of all they do require that the singlet and the doublet mass must uh, be close to each other in mass so there has to be a relatively small mass splitting between these particles because this way um, the uh, the dark matter the, the relic density the dark matter uh, that is uh, provided in this model it does explain uh, is able to address all the cosmological problems that we mentioned uh, earlier. So missing satellite galaxies, Kuzpor and too big to fail problem. Um, the uh, other uh, couplings of this uh, that appear in the Lagrangian, lambda 2, 3, and 7, they are related only to processes that convert uh, dark matter particles into other of the new BSM particles that we added. So anyway, they do not have too much uh, phenomenological impact. So we just uh, fix them to some uh, values uh, that are uh, suitable for, for our purposes. Uh, again, we said that M3 has to be not much larger than V for the reason that we said above. And anyway, what we do, we fix uh, the remaining coupling uh, lambda 2 and we vary instead this parameter epsilon. Uh, finally, as we said, since the masses of the uh, scalar and the and the lightest um, right-handed neutrino has to be close to each other. We scan uh, above. Uh, uh, we scan their uh, mass ratio between the range uh, 0 0.1 and 0 0.98. Um, finally, the the constraints from the neutrino sector. 
these uh, are taken into account uh, by means of the so-called Casa Sibara parametrization. So through these, um, th through this uh, clever parametrization, we are able to translate the constraints from um, neutrinos measurements into constraints on the parameter space of the model. So basically, it's just a redefinition. So the, the neutrino um, masses um, are obtained uh, through the expression that you can see here, uh, which, uh, is, um, which comes from the diagram, the loop diagram that you see above. So this is the diagram that is responsible for the masses of the neutrinos. And by inverting this relation, uh, we are able to set constraints on the lambda eight um, parameter, starting from uh, measurements in the neutrino sector. So the PMNS matrix and the um, and the mass um, and the diff and the absolute difference and the masses of the neutrinos, which is also something that is measured experimentally. And everything uh, comes out. So the, basically, after applying this. Um, parametrization once we put uh, we, we give as input the neutrino measurements we op automatically obtain a lambda 8 parameter that uh, generates the correct masses uh, of the neutrinos as well as their uh, mixing so we uh, immediately uh, recover their masses and the pmns matrix so um, all in all, basically, we have a long list of parameters and we have uh, performed our phenomenological study using this chain of tools. So we implemented, uh, we wrote the Lagrangian in a specific form that is useful to as, as input in SARA. Uh, with SARA, we have been able to generate Feynman rules and Sphino codes and micro mega codes that can be compiled. Uh, Sphino is used to generate the spectrum of the model for each parameter space point and also to calculate some of the low energy observables. And with MicroMega instead, we, we, are, uh, we use it to calculate the relic density for each parameter space model. Uh, so uh, the first, uh, the first uh, observables that we, that we checked was the relic density. As you can see in this model, we can obtain a really uh, large, uh, we can obtain relic density in a really large range. Um, however, you can see this uh, blue line in the um, in the plot in the top left. It, this one sets the uh, exactly the relic density that is measured by the Planck collaboration. And if we project all this parameter space point uh, on this line, we can see that we still have a reasonable number of uh, parameter space points, which satisfies uh, the relic density constraints. And, and you can see that the range of the dark matter particle, which is our lightest right-handed neutrino, uh, can go from a uh, so few MeV up to uh, about 10 GeV. So in this model, this is the range of dark matter masses that we explore. Um, the next uh, observables that we took into account is the lepton flavor violating constraints. So as I said, since the new particles they couple to the um, charged lepton so in the standard model, we have some contribution to uh, lepton flavor violating uh, processes. Um, here we consider first uh, the, uh, the, the constraints from uh, MEG experiments on mu to uh, E gamma in the conversion mu to E gamma, but similar, uh, very similar constraints can be, um, uh, can be obtained if one considers uh, other um, lepton flavor violating experiments such as the conversion mu into uh, three electrons or uh, the capture of a muon in a in titanium uh, going to uh, electron in titanium. Anyway, um, you can see that the uh, these solid lines, they uh, in the plot, they correspond to the current uh, limits, uh, while the dashed line is just a projection of future limits. Anyway, you can see that basically the um, imposing lepton flavor violating uh, constraints on this particular observable strongly constrains 
the parameter space of the model, mostly actually this uh, lambda eight uh, parameter. You have the lambda eight coupling to the electrons in the x axis and in the colored um, the color scheme instead you have the coupling to the muon. So basically, the uh, from these constraints, this lambda eight coupling is constrained uh, to be uh, below ten to the minus two or ten to the minus three. And future measurements will increase uh, these bounds by roughly a factor four. Um, uh, the last uh, uh, the last constraints that I want to talk about um, concerns the possibility of uh, detecting uh, the uh, the interaction of uh, dark matter particles with electrons in direct detection experiments. So this is uh, quite a novel thing. Generally, yeah. Thanks for two minutes left. Um, generally, one uh, would uh, consider the scattering of the of dark matter particle over uh, over nuclei. But since this model is particularly lepto leptophilic and the dark matter is particularly light, uh, we have perhaps more chances to observe the recoil of dark matter particles on electrons. So the diagrams that are responsible for this process are drawn here in the top right. And what we did is to pre we performed um, a, phys a feasibility study uh, considering the sensitivity uh, so after some um, consideration on the sensitivity on the xenon one ton experiment. So the ionization rate can be written uh, like this. And in this uh, expression, uh, there are several factors that enters. We have particle physics. Um, uh, particle physics enters in this uh, dark matter electron cross section, which will be calculated from the two diagrams above. We have nuclear and atomic physics, which enters in these two factors uh, that I highlighted in green. We have ionization form factor and a correction uh, for the uh, wave function of the escaping electron uh, due to the fact uh, that we have some uh, screening of the charge of the of the nuclear of the nuclei. And finally, we have astrophysics quantity that enters in this uh, eta, uh, which is the mean inverse dark matter velocity. I have more details on this later on if you have questions. Um, so basically, what we wanted to do first is to uh, consider how, uh, which is this, the size of dark matter electron cross section that we would expect in this model. And here we uh, we show which kind of cross section we would expect for uh, dark matter masses uh, around the MeV scale. And as you can see, even for very large lambda eight coupling, and with very large, I mean, we can go, we cannot go uh, above ten to the minus two. Uh, still, the the um, the cross section, the dark matter to electron cross section, does not go above ten to the minus fifty two centimeters square, and this is extremely low value. Indeed, it is actually several order of magnitude, like. 10 order of magnitude uh, above the most uh, optimistic um, projection for uh, sensitivity in this uh, in a direct detection experiment. Um, in, in our work, we actually uh, discussed uh, extensively the possibility of uh, improving uh, the sensitivity of um, xenon experiment in this in this um, very low um, uh, dark matter mass region for their sensitivity regarding the scattering uh, over electrons. However, after some discussion and the possibility of reducing the, um, the signal, uh, I mean, instead of considering the coincidence of the two signals, S1 and S2, given from scintillation and, and ionization signals, we thought about the possibility of considering only just one of the signals, uh, the S2, because it has a much lower energy um, threshold. But even in that case, uh, we still have a quite, uh, a quite high background that we cannot reduce. And even in that case, uh, with such a high background, the limits, uh, the, the sensitivity of the experiments uh, just uh, drops down. And these ranges of, uh, of cross-section 
uh, is difficult to will be really hard to to observe in the future. Anyway, this drives me to my conclusion. Um, I think I probably am running out of time, so I will just uh, leave it here and uh, for you to read it and wait for questions. If any. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Yuri. <clears throat> we have a few minutes for a quick question, <clears throat> if uh, there are any. If not, you might want to read the conclusion. OK. Um, OK, I will read the conclusion. Well, meanwhile, just, uh, meanwhile, people maybe, they uh, come out with some questions. So um, the summary of the talk just um, is, is highlighted here. We have considered a variant of the SLIM model uh, with uh, uh, where um, in this minimal model we have right-handed neutrinos which play the role as, uh, as dark matter candidate and with the addition uh, of some interaction of uh, some new particles that we have included in the in the in the model uh, we were able also to generate uh, neutrino masses radiatively. Uh, the lightest uh, neut right-handed neutrino, which plays the role of dark matter, comes out naturally uh, with a mass of the order of MeV to GV. Um, uh, by fine-tuning uh, the um, with a small fine-tuning of the of the parameter uh, of the models, we were able to uh, reproduce the correct relic density, and we have we have imposed. In the parameter space of the model constraints from all the other uh, experiments, Col colliders, uh, lepton flavor violating, etc. And finally, we also studied the possibility of uh, detection of this uh, of this model in uh, indirect detection experiment uh, through uh, scattering of dark matter to electrons, which is a novel and recent development of uh, of this kind of experiments. There is a question from Kalpana. Yes, please. You would need to unmute yourself. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, hello. Can you listen? Can you hear me? Yes. Huh. So I have a question that is the dark matter, is it a, a mixture of the right-handed neutrinos and the scalars? Uh, yes, yes, indeed, the uh, mass eigenstates, uh, I have it here, yes. Um, so, ah, no, no, sorry, sorry. Um, the, so we have, in, this, in the model, we have two scalar, uh, we, we have a, the scalars, uh, the doublet, the, the new doublet that is introduced, which mixes with uh, the Higgs and the scalars and the, and the complex singlet that we have introduced. So Higgs we will. And the complex singlet. Yes. Okay. Yes. So basically, this mu parameter mixes the, the new scalar doublet, this eta that we introduced, with the Higgs, which is this capital phi, and this uh, rho, which is the, um, the, scalar, the scalar complex singlet. And these, they mix together, giving rise to a light uh, scalar, actually two light scalars, one real and one imaginary, and two that are heavier. The two lights, uh, the light scalars are necessary in order to um, satisfy, to, to address for the um, cosmological um, problems that we mentioned in the beginning. Uh, they have to be light, they have to be, so in order to address this, uh, this issue, they have, the scalar has to be close in mass to the lightest, um, to the lightest um, right-handed neutrinos, which plays the role of the dark matter. Okay. I hope this uh, answer your question. Okay, thank you, Yuri, again. Okay. So, Katerina, would you like to introduce the... Okay, I can stop sharing. Yes, thank okay. you. Yes, so uh, we have now the next talk. And it's, uh, if you can start sharing the slides already. It's about the scintillating bubble chamber for dark matter and uh, also reactor CE 
new NS. I hope I pronounced it correctly. So this is Pietro Giampa from Triumph. Hi, um, thanks for the introduction. Of course. Um, okay, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about the scintillating bubble chamber or SPC experiment. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I have decided um, that I will, uh, oops, I'm sorry, um, that I will uh, skip the, the general dark mass introduction and, and talk directly about the SPC overall strategy and kind of why are we doing this and kind of wh uh, what is the plan for SPC. And then I'm going to talk about the SPC experiment itself. Uh, and then give a quick update on what the current status and timelines are uh, and wrap it up as conclusion. So let's jump straight in with the SPC strategy. In order to talk about SPC, I really have to uh, um, talk a little bit about how bubble chambers work to begin with. Uh, and so if we look at top left plot, um, if you take a standard fluid, uh, you are going to sit somewhere in, in the pressure versus temperature parameter space, uh, like this uh, uh, blue dots here. Um, in, in your liquid phase, and that corresponds to a Gibbs potential that is shown on the right hand side uh, with one single settle point. But you can imagine that if you can bring the pressure down very slowly, say from the blue point all the way to the red point, uh, you move from the liquid to the vapor phase, but you don't actually change phase. So you, rem you, rem you remain in a, in a fluid state and, and, and you're now in what it's called a superheated uh, fluid state. Uh, and the corresponding Gibbs potential on the other side for, for the blue point now becomes the red line, which has two settle points, uh, one uh, lower. And that's quite important because if we have a particle interaction with the superfluid, uh, we know that energy deposition in any material leads to either, you know, many mechanisms, whether it's scintillation, ionization, or the, or the formation of heat. Uh, and uh, if heat is well localized, you can actually make the transition from liquid to, uh, to gas phase and therefore uh, go undergo nucleation or forming bubbles. Uh, and that's quite important because the heat is to be fairly localized to do so. And we know that there is a big difference in the EDX for between nuclear recoil and electronic recoils. Uh, and so if we can tune let the so-called threshold, meaning if we can tune the pressure which we operate in order to maximize this, this uh, settle points difference, uh, we can then uh, operate in, in, at threshold such that we're completely uh, blind to electronic uh, recoils because they don't have enough local E to overcome the uh, minimum threshold to generate a bubble. And so those, those little detectors have become extremely uh, useful lately for low background application and PICO is one a great example on the right hand side. Um, but then if you think about turning the fluid into a liquid scintillator, say for instance, if you take a liquid noble like argon or xenon, uh, you get the benefit that a fraction of the deposit energy by the particle also goes into the scintillation mode, which you can then use uh, to uh, interpolate more physics. And that's really the overview of SBC. The plan is to combine the electron recall discrimination of bubble chamber with the event by event energy resolution and low threshold liquid noble detectors. Um, and what I mean with that is the bubble chambers in low background techniques are particularly good because of the tunable threshold as, as Pico has already shown that you can operate down to KV uh, values. Uh, while retaining ER blindness, meaning that your electron recalls just don't have enough uh, localized heat uh, to generate bubbles, uh, meaning that you have a whole set of backgrounds that you just won't see in your detector uh, with millimeter scale position resolution and Pico has shown this is a scalable technology. And so if you switch to a scintillating bubble chamber, what you gain is that um, you can actually push your threshold to much lower value all the way down to the tens of, of EV um, while retaining your blindness. And um, this can be seen in the plot to the right uh, which shows the probability of forming a bubble uh, from a typical electron rec recoil on the y-axis versus threshold on, on the, uh, uh, the x-axis in KV. And then you'll see this, those are the standard uh, limit plots from um, electron recoil stimulation from, from PICO. And I'll mention later that collaborators in, in, in SPC have operated a liquid xenon bubble chamber demonstrating already that you can push uh, down to much, much lower thresholds with liquid argon uh, while retaining ER blindness and millimeter scale position resolution because of the imaging. Uh, but you also add calorimetry now through the scintillation process. Um, 
uh, and you have a scalable technology, as I mentioned. Um, and those properties are actually really good um, for two type of searches. Um, so you can perform a very competitive low mass WIM search, even with just 10 kilograms of liquid argon. So if you, if you build an SPC detector or a liquid uh, scintillating bubble chamber on the scale of 10 kilograms here, you can already perform a pretty competitive dark matter search, carving even a, a complete new free uh, set of parameter space in the standard uh, spin independent WIMP nuclear cross section as a function of WIMP mass parameter space. And that's our plan uh, for operations at Snow Lab. Uh, but it turns out that those kind of detectors are also extremely good um, to do precision measurement of, of Korean elastic scatters of neutrinos and argon and xenon. Uh, and so we, we're interested in, for instance, studying reactor uh, neutrinos uh, with this. And here's an example of the rate above threshold as a function of recoil energy, uh, recoil threshold. Uh, for the currently, uh, uh, we're, we're working with UNAM to identify a new site for this. And so we plan on building two identical detectors with minor tweaks uh, to optimize for the independent research, for one for dark matter and one for neutrinos. Uh, and we're going to be doing this in phases. It's actually multiple phases. So the first phase is what we call SPC Fermilab. Uh, that will be operating in Chicago, uh, a Fermilab. Uh, and uh, the plan is to build and commission a first detector really to study the uh, threshold effect. In parallel, we're planning to build an identical detector with just a little bit more uh, attention paid to low background material selections uh, and maybe some minor tweaks uh, at Snow Lab to, comp uh, to complete a low mass dark matter search. And then finally, uh, the plan is to dismantle the detector uh, on, in phase one, so SPC Fermilab, upgrade it and move it to a reactor site uh, for the study uh, or, or of coherent elastic scattering neutrinos. And we're currently uh, considering the Laguna Verde site in, in Mexico. Um, so this is really what are we doing with SPC, what are our goal and what is our plan? So let's talk a little bit about the experiment itself. Um, uh, we have a collaboration that is shown here. Uh, this is mostly um, a, com a combination of Canadian, US and Mexico uh, effort. Uh, and you can see some of the names here you might be able to recognize uh, with the impossible to miss this day's uh, picture of a Zoom collaboration meeting, uh, which is a must. Um, so what has the, the collaboration achieved so far? Where well, collaborators at Northwestern universities have operated uh, this liquid xenon bubble chamber, which you can see a picture of the chamber here on the left-hand side. Uh, this is a very centered bubble chamber, but they were able to operate it down to 500 electron volts in, in threshold, uh, despite having only 30 grams of mass and a 0.3% overall uh, photo collection efficiency. Uh, and they were able to see interesting events, like for instance, this, this bubble, and, and they were able to spot uh, the scintillation light from the neutron-induced bubble and followed by the acoustic signal where the difference really lies in the speed of, uh, uh, of, light, uh, of light and center. Um, and so they were able to demonstrate that you can push the treasure really low. They didn't see any evidence of nucleation from, uh, from electronic recoil. And they were able to test with a neutron source fairly well the nuclear response as well. Uh, but that was just an, a, a test. The next phase, the next part of the program uh, is to use liquid argon, is to create a liquid argon bubble chamber and try to operate it down to 40 electron volts uh, with a total mass of 10 kilograms. Um, and we're planning for an electron recall background of about one bubble per ton year. Um, and we'll see in a minute that we have a photo election, photo, overall photo collection efficiency of 2%, so a large improve compared to the demonstrator. Uh, so here's what the detector looks like. Uh, for those familiar with uh, with um, bubble chambers, is the so-called right side up geometry that you may have seen from Pico lately with atomic gradient. Uh, the liquid argon itself is contained within two few silica jars, uh, an outer jar that you can see here at the rim, and then an inner jar uh, shown down below here. The inner jar is actually controlled by an hydraulic pistons that allows us to, to, to pressure cycle the target and uh, bring the liquid argon into superheated state uh, and then repressurize and depressurize again in multiple cycle of between 20 to 360 PSI. Um, any events that occurs within the liquid argon um, will be visualized by the cameras above. The scintillation light is measured using silicon photomultipliers that are spread across the, the jar. 
Um, and we're also listening with piezoacoustic sensor to, to the bubbles. I should mention that the liquid argon is actually spiked with uh, about 100 ppms of, of, of xenon. This is primarily to switch, to shift the scintillation light from 128 nanometer peak to 178 nanometer peak in order to be a little bit more friendly with the transmission of, of the jar. Um, and as I mentioned, well, as I mentioned with, with a liquid argon target, it comes the difficulty of doing this in a cryogenic environment. So the entire detector is placed inside a, a pressure vessel which sits inside a vacuum jacket. I also want to highlight that there is a thermal gradient within our detector. So you can see that the bottom is actually set at about 90K while the top is on the order where the, the, the main target is on the order of 130. Um, and this is really done because we want to make sure that we can operate the target at the top in a superheated state, uh, but the bottom side of the fluid uh, will not be in a superheated state even after decompression so that we don't get pathological events from the bottom. And to, to better visualize how we do that, um, that, that thermal gradient, I wanted to show you a, a, an engineer rendering of, uh, of the actual detector, just to show you that things are not just the sketches. Um, here you can see kind of the condenser and the cooling air that provides the liquid argon. Um, and this is the cooling band that allows us, uh, which is ni liquid nitrogen fed, uh, that allows us to keep that thermal gradient from where the jars are and the sippums, as you can see here, to the rest of the compression system. Um, I want to spend just a little bit more time talking about the readout system. Uh, I mentioned briefly, but let me go back and explain a little bit more into detail. So if you look at our detector at the very top, and you can see here the housing light out here in the top uh, left, we have three high speed cameras on the order of 100 FPC and a resolution of one megapixel uh, that are used uh, in combination with IR illumination to, to image the bubbles in the chamber. Um, then alongside that, we have 32 Amamatsu VV4 quads, silicon photomultipliers uh, that allow that are spread across the, the, the outer jar, as you can see here, a wraparound reflectors material uh, completely across the jar and allow us to detect the scintillation light emitted by uh, the stimulation of the liquid argon all the way down to a 5 kV and R uh, estimated in nuclear interactions. And finally, we also want to listen to the bubble. So we have a piezos transducer uh, laid out uh, across the jar at the bottom. Those are quite important because as, as we have learned from other bubble chamber, the ability to listen to bubble enable us to decouple uh, um, uh, particle IDing within the nuclear recoil uh, definitions between neutrons and alphas. So one natural question that you might want to ask yourself after seeing what the detector looks like is how low in threshold can SPC really go? So this really becomes a threshold game. And so we know that historically, uh, so we know that electron recoil, sorry, uh, can lose up to 10% of their deposited energy through heat. Uh, this actually mainly occurs just after the recombination uh, and the simulation uh, for, for argon and, and xenon particularly. And this, would be, this seems to be consistent with historic results of liquid argon bubble chambers observing tracks on the order of tens of electron volts in threshold. Um, now, one of the things that it's quite important to mention is that thermal fluctuations have to be extremely well understood in order to pin down and, and understand processes at the order of tens of EV in threshold. And what I mean with that is that you really need to understand the boundaries of your first continuum, which is shown here on the plot on the right. Uh, to really understand how localized your heat distribution in, in, in per, in, per ER interaction is. Um, however, with, with a current understanding of, of, a thermal fluctu of thermal fluctuation, a threshold, we expect the SPC detector to, to, to be able to run with a, a, a background of one bubble per ton year from, uh, from electronic recoil interactions uh, at a threshold of 40 EV. Uh, for liquid argon. And I should mention that the very purpose of SPC Fermilab is to stress, stress test this and really study this very precisely. And so to do that, we need also a, a calibration plan uh, for, for this uh, study as well. And this is really where the beryllium-9 photo neutron source comes about. There are some challenges, obviously. We're limited to the number of bubbles per day that we can generate simply by the compression rate in our chambers. Um, and we want to make sure that we have a source that we can also extrapolate good information from the symptoms coverage. 
Um, so we decided to go with this beryllium nine because uh, being a photoneutron source allows us to, to, to really not be swamped by, by gammas um, uh, like most standard MB sources really are. Um, and our plan is obviously to, 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 uh, to study uh, neutrons interaction and gammas interaction separately. So we wanted a source that will uh, enable us to decouple that. So that's our plan. Uh, what is the current status? Uh, so we're not just designing stuff uh, or planning stuff anymore. We've been building stuff uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, so one example is that the, the electronics, for instance, for the photo readouts are completed uh, now in, in a Fermilab. Um, you can see the various component of the inner assembly of the detector are already, uh, are already ready and have been tested at Fermilab, like the piston shaft, uh, like the pressure vessel, like the vacuum jacket. You can see our press, uh, the pressure vessel being tested outside of Fermilab. Uh, the process system uh, is being built. Um, obviously, things came to a stop um, with COVID, uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, we, we, we're now slowly being able to start making moves uh, again. Um, so here's what our plan and uh, tentative schedule going forward is. Please take this with a grain of salt as we are all trying to understand um, the impact that the pandemic has on our schedules. So um, we're, we're getting access and we, uh, to laboratories and, and, ac and access to different spaces. So we're trying to learn more, but obviously keep in mind that the schedule is very fluid as we're all moving forward. So our plan is to continue now that we, we're getting access to, to some of our construction site, to continue the SPC formula construction, which started earlier this year, with the goal of finishing in the first trimester of 2021, uh, followed immediately by the operation of this SPC Fermilab uh, detector, uh, really with the goal of studying uh, uh, events, uh, neutrons, uh, nuclear recoil, and electronic recoil uh, at threshold, and understand the impact of thermal fluctuations to a threshold. In parallel, starting in the last uh, trimester of 2021, we want to start building the SPC Snow Lab detector on site, and, and some preparation for that obviously have already started. Um, and, and we have taken the opportunity of, uh, of the, let's say, break um, that we have taken from, uh, from SPC Formula construction due to the pandemic to start working, to start uh, fast tracking some of the, uh, the uh, processes for SPC Snow Lab. Uh, the plan is to complete the construction in, by the last trimester of uh, 2022 and then start the operation. Uh, with a first start master results to follow shortly. Um, and then in 2023, uh, the plan is to uh, repurpose the SPC Fermilab chamber into the SPC 7s chamber for the study of Korean elastic uh, neutrino neutrons uh, scatterings uh, at the reactor side on, in, in Mexico. Uh, so I might be a little bit ahead of time, but probably for the best, we gain a little bit of time back. So let me draw some conclusion. Hopefully I've shown you that uh, scintillating bubble chambers provide a unique uh, technique for low mass uh, WIMS detection in uh, a scalable uh, option with ER blindness, uh, given uh, uh, low thresholds all the way up to 40 dB. Um, we're planning on, on, on doing very detailed calibration studies for a liquid argon bubble chamber after we after some of the collaborators have already tested a liquid xenon bubble chamber at Fermilab, which we expect to start in 2021. Uh, and we're gearing up for the or dark matter study at Snow Lab by late 2021, where we uh, anticipate starting the construction of the detector with first results by 2022. And obviously we're investigating also the possibility uh, for a site reactor so that we could also study Korean elastic neutrino scatterings. Uh, and we're narrowing down to a, a site in, in, in Mexico, Laguna Verde. Um, but I also wanted to people to keep in mind that, that, that we're also uh, thinking about a potential ton scale um, SPC snow lab or something on the order of ton scale to get us uh, all the way to, to the neutrino floor for dark matter searches in the low mass uh, WIMP as well. Uh, so we, we're, we're a very energetic collaboration and always looking for new members. So if you're interested, feel free to ping any one of the members that you've seen on the collaboration slide. And with that, that's it for me and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. It's uh, nice to see that there's a lot of uh, effort for the low mass side of uh, dark matter. Um, 
Is there anyone who has questions? There's, I think, I see many. That's great that you were, but we, we, can, uh, we can take them. So the first hand up I see from my great dukes. So you can uh, unmute yourself and speak. Yes, uh, I have a question about how often do, uh, did you do you cycle uh, this bubble chamber? I'm not quite sure I got that. Um, so for cycle, we, we really repressurize the chamber every time we have um, evident. Well, every time we see we, we, we trigger uh, the chamber. Uh, so it really will depend on which mode you operate with and um, and 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 um, at what. And, and if, if you're running with some calibration mode of which source you're using, uh, but you're bounded to, to even at, uh, if you would constantly recycle, you're bounded to up to a thousand cycles per day, just to give an idea of, of the length of the cycles. How far can you go between cycles? Um, that's a very good question. I would have to go back and think about it before I can give you an answer. Sorry about that. Thank you. Then we have in order of hands, uh, Adrian Di Giovanni. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for, for your talk and uh, great idea and beautiful detector. So I was thinking that uh, since you are actually considering of doping the argon with xenon, actually I don't remember the exact number, but there is sort of magic number for the concentration that uh, actually increase a lot uh, the infrared emission. So you could even exploit this channel in order to uh, recover a bit the light collection. And of course, then you need to uh, also uh, add a proper detector. But since you are using uh, uh, liquid argon doped with liquid xenon, so with xenon, so I think it's worth uh, investigating this, uh, this possibility. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the comment. It, it, it is a, an extremely valid comment indeed. Um, we, we are aware of um, the IR emission, uh, especially after uh, uh, in argon f uh, after xenon pollution, and so we're actually undergoing a, a we're about to start sorry a, a more detailed R uh, study of the xenon doping uh, with a few col uh, other collaborators and some out of collaboration members in order to understand exactly as you said where the correct balance is in between maximizing 178. Uh, nanometer light and IR light. So yeah, thank you very much for the comments. Very well taken, and and we'll we'll study that for sure to optimize that. Thank you. And then we have a question from Ablet. Okay. Uh, thanks, and this very interesting experiment. So, so just a simple question: How do you uh, distinguish between the, the events from the dark matter? Or or from wind compared to the compared to the events from background. Right. So, so in that respect, it becomes very much like any dark matter search. Um, in in uh, say the plot that you see really on on the bottom right hand side. Uh, so it really becomes a matter of modeling your background extremely precisely, and then look for deviation in your um, in your background model. Um, in the parameter space that you expected WIMP interaction uh, in your detector. So you really, it, it really become, becomes a counting exercise. Um, and then depending on if you do see a signal, depending on how intense that count is, you can reconstruct then properties, basic properties of a potential signal like mass um, and intensities, uh, or I guess local densities. Okay. so. The, in that case, for example, for the data taking, how long are you planning to run the detector? Like uh, several years? Right. So yeah, exactly. So you you expect um, uh, um, I would say at least a couple of years of operation. Uh, there's obviously you get you got to walk a line between maximizing your exposure and 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 uh, whatever your funding allows you to do. <laughs> obviously, uh, but yeah, we're talking about multi-year. Um, program, uh, operations. Okay, thanks. No, no worries. Then we have one more question by Paul Mother. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, maybe you've said it, but um, the superheated state, how stable is it? Um, do you have to keep the pressure really, really tight or is it uh, a lot more stable than, than I imagined? 
Um, so, again, they're really, uh, this really goes, uh, I, I assume you're obviously talking about um, operating at uh, a, a, as low as threshold as you can go. Uh, so that's really what, what we're planning on doing with SPC Fermilab. So we want to understand exactly the stability and, uh, and, and the performance at our target threshold of 40 EV. Um, and that includes also the ability of our uh, system to deliver a stable operation at, at that particular threshold. Uh, so we know from other bubble chambers that uh, the stability uh, at threshold is, is, is very good and the operation at threshold is very good. Um, but as I mentioned in liquid argon, we also have to, uh, um, to deal with uh, internal physics that are currently unknown like thermal fluctuations and so on. Uh, so we're planning to study that very methodically all the way down to the 40 EV. Uh, but remember that the beauty of this of, of this detectors is that um, it, you can always change at what level you depressurize to run at higher thresholds if you want. So if it turns out that you know your threshold, for instance, at, I'll give you a random example. Uh, say you're running a, a liquid xenon bubble chamber. It turns out that your threshold at, a high, at 200 EV is too low and it's not stable enough, you can always operate at 300 and so on. So it really becomes then a game of where you set your threshold. But we're hoping that at 40 EV will, we'll, uh, we'll, no, we're hoping, but we're confident that at 40 EV, we should, uh, we're, we should be able to operate uh, stable. Uh, thank you. No, welcome. So thank you very much. A round of virtual applause for the sp speaker again, and uh, we can move on to the next talk. Can I ask a question? Sorry, I can't raise my hand. So, <laughs> Pietro, what are the background assumptions that you consider for the exclusion plot? It's uh, one bubble per ton year, or and well, the one bubble? Yeah, so that's the. Well, main what is the background? So you, you show the plot now for ten kilogram years and one ton. Um, yeah, so that's that's our expected background, which includes contribution uh, from you know. Standard component, uh, standard environmental components plus the inner detector components, to the best of our knowledge, right now, obviously, uh, and, and that's the background on the order from simulation. Yeah, no. and so okay. that's the design. Yeah, and so we use the simulation to design to tune the design to one per ton year. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Sorry. So next, uh, thank you, thank you, Pietro. So next speaker is uh, Francesco Pandolfi. So if you want to start. Uh, sharing the slide. And he is going to talk about carbon nanostructure for directional LIDAR matter detection. And Francesco is from INFN uh, Roma. So we can see the slide. Thank you. Yeah, let me unmute. How do you do that? Oh, I was unmuted. Okay, let me share again, sorry. All right. I just had a power cut at my flat five minutes ago, so I hope that doesn't happen again during the talk. Anyways, um, yeah, hi everybody. So yeah, I'll be talking about carbon nanostructures for directional light dark matter detection. I'm gonna show you some recent results uh, of the R&D we've done in Rome and Princeton over the past uh, months. So the starting point is uh, this plot. We all know this plot, we've seen it a thousand times. Um, the exclusion cross-section as a function of dark matter mass. And we also know that to move around in this plot, there's basically two directions. There's the vertical direction that you can go down and get better limits if you increase your exposure of your detector. And this obviously mm -hmm. typically means large mass. We all know that these, uh, these limits are all dominated by these multi-ton experiments uh, that we also saw in the previous talks that were mentioned. And then you can also move horizontally in this, in this plot and that would, and, by, by move, I mean, by changing your threshold, by lowering your threshold, you can achieve better limits uh, moving to the left. So that's the region where we're interested in, the left side of that plot, um, because in particular, the sub-GV region. Uh, and there, as we know, the, the limits are much, much weaker, up to 10 to the 10 times weaker. Uh, and this means that in order to, to have competitive results, you can actually get away with uh, uh, much smaller targets, even or, of the order of grams. Um, and, and to access that region, the reason why all those, those curves tend to fall off towards the GV is that most of those searches are based on nuclear recoils, which is limited by about, yeah, a lower uh, threshold of one GV. And to go down, you have to, as we know, uh, start looking at electron recoils to go down to the MEV scale. 
And another important thing that we're working on is to is focus really on directional um, detectors. Directionality, I mean, to link a possible signal to a region of the sky is very useful, obviously, because we expect the dark matter signals that come from Cygnus. Uh, but it's also a way to, to, to effectively fight backgrounds. I mean, the neutrino flora that is uh, there in the, the, the cyan uh, shade uh, can actually be almost completely avoided at those masses as it's mostly dominated by solar neutrinos and Cygnus and, and the sun never really overlap during, during the year. So what I will talk about today is uh, detectors which aim for that region and that use uh, uh, solid state targets. And in particular, well, you can do the usual back of the envelope calculation for um, a classical calculation for dark matter with masses between 10 and 100 MeV, you get that the kinetic energy is between five and 50 EV approximately. And uh, that is enough to extract uh, an electron from carbon, the work function is 4.3 electron volts. So then you end up with a, with a recoil electron, which has a kinetic energy of about one to 50, say, electron volts. So uh, very soft. Uh, and in particular, that electron will have an extremely short range in matter, especially in, in solid matter. Um, and this is why you, what we're advocating is that you need, uh, in order to have solid state to, to targets, you, uh, the, the advantage of, of this whole thing is to, is to have two dimensional materials, such as graphene or na carbon nanotubes, uh, because in these materials, the, the electron is ejected directly into the vacuum. And so you don't, um, you don't have the problem that the electron is re reabsorbed in, in the density of the matter. So let's start with graphene. Um, here, uh, most of the work is based in Princeton, the stuff that I'm gonna show you, and uh, it's, also, it's shared with uh, the Ptolemy project. Uh, which you might have heard of, and if not, there's a talk later today by Marcelo Messina in, 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 in another session, which I, I suggest you, you go listen to. Um, Ptolemy aims to measure the cosmic neutrino background and wants to do that with, uh, with a tritiated graphene target, a very large target, actually up to half a kilogram. Um, and so having to deal with so much graphene, there's obviously a lot of R&D on that. And some of that R&D is also geared, let's say, towards using graphene in dark matter searches. And so the idea here is to construct these uh, graphene uh, field effect transistors, uh, GFET, which basically you can, they're just like a normal FET, but the source and drain are connected by these graphene nano ribbons, which are basically very thin ribbons of graphene, which have a width uh, of less than 50 nanometers. And so this makes them a, practically a one dimensional material and that have very specific electrical properties that depend on this uh, width W. And so what you see here, um, what I'm showing is some, some recent results. So you can see the nano ribbon in question that has produced these results is shown, there's a, there's a um, scanning electron microscope image in the top left. Uh, so you can see the ribbon is, that, is actually that little line, the vertical line. Uh, and it's 3.5 microns long and has a width of 35 nanometers and connects these two contacts, the source and the drain. Now, what you see here on the plot is that the conductance of this nanoribbon uh, varies quite um, significantly as a function of the gate voltage. So not the source and drain, but the gate, which is at the bottom of the, of the FET. And you have these three regions. There's a conductivity region on the left, which is mainly due to hole con conductivity. And there's another conductivity on the right, which is mainly due to electrons. And then there's a region in the center in which the conductivity drops uh, significantly. And that's the charge neutrality point. Or, yeah, it, it happens at charge neutrality. And as you can see, the different colors are different temperatures. And as you decrease the temperature, so you go towards blue, uh, the drop is actually hits very low values. And so you actually get a, a region in gate voltage in which your nano ribbon becomes not conductive and have a, has a semiconductive behavior. And now when you go close to that region, uh, this has been shown in 2007 in this article here, uh, the, the nano ribbon is extremely sensitive to even single changes in the electronic con configuration. And what you see here, this is uh, the blue and the red or, or absorption and desorption of single molecules of uh, nitrogen dioxide. Every little jump you see there is, a, is corresponds to one electric charge. And you can see that these are measurable charge in, um, jumps in, uh, in resistivity. They're about two to 2.5 ohms. So it, it, it's very measurable. 
So you have a thing that basically is sensitive and can measure the emission of a single or the arrival of a single electron. And so to use that as a dark matter detector, what you do is just build a lot of them. Um, you have all these ribbons and you actually, the idea is to put them in this uh, top bottom configuration like a sandwich um, in which then the two nano ribbons are then also uh, on the two sides, you have these, uh, these two electrodes. And the reason to have the electrodes is that once the, the dark matter arrives, it'll kick out an electron and then the electron will be ejected in vacuum and then the, electrode, the electrodes will have the, the, the function of re-accelerating it back to the detector. So it'll just land in another uh, GFET, some, some delta X space um, far away. And so a dark matter event would actually be the, the, the coincidence of two cells firing, the, the departure cell and the arrival cell. And, uh, and a possible signal will appear as an excess of top versus bottom events when you align this detector to signals. And now the cool thing is that this, this drift, the electron drift is, is completely classical and you can solve the equations. And actually when, if you know the electric field and you know the, the amount of distance that's been traveled and you add also a time of flight information to your detector, then you have everything you need and you can solve the equations and you can fully reconstruct with just these, these three things, the velocity of the electron at departure. And now once you have the velocity, then you can correlate that with the, with the dark matter direction. And there you go, you have a directional detector. So that was graphene. Then let's move on to nanotubes. I'll spend a little more, more time on that because that's the stuff we're working on right now in Rome. Um, so, okay, nanotubes, you can, you can imagine a nanotube as just a, a single graphene sheet, which is wrapped up in, in the form of a straw. Um, and these, these nanotubes can be grown in, in labs. And you can actually, with this, with this uh, uh, CBD, chemical vapor deposition technique, you basically can grow forests of vertically aligned nanotubes. And the tubes are typically, you have a typical internal diameter of 20 nanometers, a length of a few hundreds of microns. And depending on the growth technique, they can be either single-walled or multi-walled, and then they can be grown in different substrates. Um, and yeah, we, we actually just recently installed a new CBD chamber in Rome. Here you can see the picture of, of the Rome group uh, happily posing next to it uh, that was just had just been installed. Uh, it was done thanks to attract funding, and the commissioning actually ended last week. So we we. We're ready to, to get the, the first growth going in this week or the next or the coming weeks. And here you can see some, some other growths we've, we've done in 2019. Here we were borrowing, let's say, the, the CBD chamber in Trieste at the Eletra facility. And here are some scanning electron microscope photographs. You can see on the left, this is on a silicon substrate. You can see all the tubes, and these are 200 microns long. Um, and on the right, this is fused silica, the substrate here. Again, you can see all these nice little vertical tubes. Uh, and these are 157 microns long, and we're not sure, but it, it might actually be one of the longest growths that has ever been done in, on fused silica. Or actually, we didn't find much uh, in the literature. So we're, we're pretty proud of these uh, growths, and we're, we're pretty excited to, to start doing them in Rome too. And if you'll allow me, I actually, I'm gonna show you another picture because I find these these uh, SEM images quite fascinating. This, uh, this is a little bit more wide angle. Uh, you can see the extent, uh, like the size to which we can, we can grow these tubes and the, uh, we get decent uniformity all across. We actually have the, the growths are usually typically one square centimeter um, large. And so how does this work for dark matter? Well, the, the key idea here is that once you do grow these nanotubes, you get a piece of matter which has highly uh, non-uniform density. And this is shown actually by these plots here. The tubes were bombarded with uh, argon ions um, and they were bombarded either laterally uh, on the sides of the tubes or longitudinally, so in, inside the, the tube axis, let's say. And you can see here in the plots, the results of Raman spectroscopy after uh, these two bombardments. And you can see that in the case of lateral bombardment, um, the pristine Raman spectrum is, is already there after only 15 microns of, of depth. So the damage is contained in the first less than 15 microns. Whereas after longitudinal bombardment, you see that the damage is, is present throughout the whole length of the tube down to 180 microns. So this, this proves that the density 
along the tube axis is much lower than the, the density in, uh, um, on the lateral side. So the actually, this actually works out nicely, uh, at least we think, for, for a dark matter target because you would have a target in which the electron, uh, the recall electron would, would be able to escape the, dark, the target only if it's traveling in the direction of the tube axis. And so this is most likely, obviously, when the tube axis is aligned with a, a dark matter wind. And so there you go, you have, again, a dark, a, an intrinsic directionality in which uh, you would lose it unless you point it in the right direction. And so the idea, uh, the, the concept we have is uh, what we call the dark PMT. And you can see it here. Uh, it, it basically, constantly, conceptually, it works like a PMT in which you have a, a cathode on one side, we've got a dark photocathode in which you have, uh, instead of photons coming in, you have the dark matter wind. Uh, they would kick out the electron, the electron escapes the tubes if, if it goes in the right direction, and then it's accelerated by an external electric field. And then on the other side of the detector is just uh, um, detected by some solid state electron counter, like an APD or something like that. And so the measurement would actually be, um, you would have these two sets of detectors, you would point one of them, in the direction of Cygnus, and then the other is in some other orthogonal direction. Then you would look for uh, a significant excess of, of, the, of the ones pointing in the right direction compared to the other ones. And so if you wrap it up and see the expected performance, here you see the, in the plot, you see the expected cross-section, the excluded cross-section for these two um, concepts. And so in black, the, the GFET, and in blue, the, the dark PMT. Um, this is an, exp an exposure of one kilogram times one year. So, I mean, obviously it's large. We're probably not going to have a kilogram of, of graphene, but just to give you an idea. And I mean, here you can see that the two concepts have pretty much similar um, expected performance. They both peak at around, have be better peak sensitivity around 20 MeV or something, and they reach down to a few MeV. Um, and so if you want to put it, uh, I mean, if you want to compare it to the usual plot we look at, um, it would, it, this, this curve would be somewhere around there. So it would be at the left side of the plot and, and kind of yeah, have this shape. So as I, sh as I showed you, um, one, of the, one of the key uh, experimental challenges of this uh, dark PMT concept is that you're going to end up with an electron that after the even after being accelerated by the field, by the electric field, they will have order of a KV energy. And so you want to make sure that whatever you have on the, on the right side of the detector can detect the KV electron with, uh, with high efficiency. So this is what we've been working on in the past months. The benchmark technology is to use avalanche photodiodes uh, simply because we have know-how, it's simple, it's, it's cheap and uh, easy to use. Uh, and the, the, what we're using right now is these Hamamatsu windowless APDs that have a, an internal diameter of three millimeters. But then we're also considering as an upgrade to switch to silicon drift detectors because they would obviously be a little more expensive, but they, were, they would uh, uh, give us ultimate energy resolution um, for, for, this, for this energy range. And for those, these are the ones we're, we're working at uh, that we have. These are produced by FPK in Italy and then the the electronics is designed and produced by Politecnico di Milano. And what we have to, to characterize these, uh, these uh, silicon detectors, we have a, a beautiful, actually, electron gun facility at uh, University of Roma 3. Uh, here you can see this is a photo of the, of the inside of the uh, ultra high vacuum chamber of, of, the, of this facility. You can see here on the right, the electron gun. And this is where the APD is facing it, so you don't see the silicon. And then there's a, there's a lot of other things that we're not really using this uh, uh, in, the, in the results I'm showing today. But I mean, we can we can do a full characterization also with UV light and uh, X-rays and all of that. Uh, but as, for the electron gun, this is uh, this is a gun with, with which produces an electrons, mono energetic electrons with an energy between 90 and 1,000 electron volts. The, the RMS on that is below 50 milli electron volts, so it's really monoenergetic. Um, and we can go down to currents uh, as low as a few femtoamps. So as this is not a bunched uh, source, it's, it means electrons with a frequency with a rate of about 10 kilohertz or something like that. And also the spatial uh, profile um, of the beam is, is very, very nice because it's, it's, it has a, 
um, it has a dispersion on X, I mean, a, a diameter, which is less than say 0.5 millimeters. So it's, you can actually have it completely contained on the sensitive art part of the APD, which is, uh, has a diameter of three millimeters. And what you see here, so um, some results uh, on, the, on the calibration of these uh, APDs with uh, low energy electrons. I mean, APDs are, are designed for photons. So, I mean, it wasn't completely trivial to use them for low energy electrons. Uh, what you see on the left is what happens if you keep the APD off, so switching off the bias, um, and then just shooting the, the, the electron beam all across its surface and, and reading, so the Z axis is just reading the, the current which is drained by the APD as you're, you're shooting with, with, the, with the gun. And what you can see is that what we get is a, is a nice little, let's call it electronic image of the APD in which you're not only sensitive to, uh, to when the gun is passing over the, the silicon, but you're actually sensitive to seeing all the electrical contacts that you have uh, around the APD and you can get this, uh, this nice image. And then instead on the right is the calibration curve that we get with, uh, with the APD at nominal bias of 350 volts. And here you see um, the, the APD current as a function of the gun current. Uh, and you can see that there's a nice, this is the, the calibration curve if you want. So there's a nice linearity, uh, the fit looks nice, the intercept is compatible with zero. Um, so, so yeah, this is, this is a nice result. And finally, um, yeah, I showed you this, uh, this uh, prototype, the dark PMT prototype. Um, and we actually built, built one, we called it Hyperion. It's, it's been assembled in Rome and it's actually, you can see, I mean, here, this is the, this is a technical design in which, uh, we expect to have nanotubes here and the APD over here and then the electric field between them. Um, and here on the right, you see the, you see the, the prototype, the actual photograph of the prototype, which is sitting in, in our lab right now. And it's, it's been assembled and it's actually ready for the first tests, which we will do next week or in the coming weeks. Okay. So th these are my conclusions. Uh, I showed you that, uh, carbon nanox structures, they offer exciting new possibilities and searches for light dark matter. In particular, the advantage here is that we're using two dimensional materials. And so we can. Uh, minimize the problem of electrons being reabsorbed in the matter because they're ejected directly into, into vacuum. And I showed you these two detector concepts, uh, both which have directional sensitivity. So the GFET made of uh, graphene nanoribbons and the dark PMT made of aligned carbon nanotubes. Um, and yeah, there's, there's been a lot of exciting R&D both in Princeton and Rome. Uh, in Rome in particular, we have a new CVD chamber uh, with which we start to um, we expect to start growing nanotubes very soon. And the dark PMT prototype, uh, which is ready for the first tests. So here my last slide is just the full list of contributors. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? Uh, a black or a black? Ablet. Ablet, sorry. I, I didn't know if it was, sorry, sometimes it is first name and last name, yeah. that's why. Uh, so I have a few questions. One is if the detector is sensitive to the energy of incoming uh, dark matters or? Well, which one? In principle? Yeah, I mean, principle. if it's just the count and the, the regardless of their, like, for example, if the dark matter comes in different energy, so you can can you reconstruct the energy of input particles or? Well, I mean, right now we're focusing on counting, at least at the stage we are right now. But I can imagine a detector in which, if if you have, I mean, if instead of an APD here you have a, a silicon drift detector, you would be reconstructing the energy of this electron very well. So if if you if you prove that the electron, once it exits the nanotubes, it, 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 it remembers the energy out of the beginning and that the, the electric field doesn't spoil that, then, I mean, in principle, it's possible, yeah. Okay, so my the other question is, uh, I feel like this also can be used as a the neutrino detector, like you can detect low energy neutrinos, so no. Well, yeah, I guess the problem, yeah, sure. Um, 
the problem with that is that you're you're still working with with very small masses, small targets in terms of uh, in mass. So as long as you're fine with very low efficiency with, with neutrinos, yeah, I guess. Okay. The the my final question is: so the detector works in at uh, normal temperature, right? Yeah, actually, this is yeah one of the things that actually I should have mentioned. Maybe it's a portable detector, and it doesn't need any any cryogenics. It it does work at at, at yeah room temperature. Obviously, you can you can squeeze out some performance of, on on this side of the detector if you want to uh, cool it down, but it's not needed necessarily. Okay, thanks. And that's actually one of the nice parts of, of using carbon, that the, the work function is so large that um, it, it's, it's basically insensitive to thermal, thermal emission. It's 4.3 EV. So next question from Paula Collins. Yeah, actually, I think you got to it with this last question, but, but this, uh, the, the question about the cooling, if you move to silicon drift detectors, will that change your approach? No, not really. Um, I mean, obviously, silicon drift detectors, if you, if you do cool them down, you can squeeze out a little bit more performance. But um, I don't think, at least at this stage, um, we're more interested in, in seeing if this technology works and, uh, and we're fine with, with room temperature SDDs. We were actually working on this last week, so it's, it's too fresh to show at ISHEP, but um, we were seeing some nice, nice uh, performance with uh, SDDs at room temperature. And room temperature right now in Rome means, you know, more than 30 degrees, so. <laughs> Next question and last from Andrew. Uh, nice talk, by the way. So you, you mentioned mass, I mean, for these dark PMTs, how, how much carbon is put into this? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. I don't remember. Is it micrograms? I don't know if Gianluca is online. I remember he was he was doing these calculations. I think a, a square centimeter of it's nanotube. One square centimeter can host up to ten milligrams. Uh, milligrams, okay. I see. Nice. So I would like to thank all the speakers of the session and 10 minutes coffee break and we will resume at 11 eastern um, 5 p.m european i think yeah, so if, you have, <laughs> if you have any other questions So if Francesco Pandolfi is not getting coffee, well, if he is, he can, but I'll try. The, 
connection to Ptolemy is interesting because I remember hearing a talk where they they were saying that they're testing multiple different uh, technologies. So is there a timeline and an idea of when they'll choose? I guess people are taking the coffee break seriously. Yeah, it's it's a good idea given that we have a, a <laughs> lot. <long>, so <laughs> I'll just ask it on Martin most. It's easier. So if the next speaker wants to ready to try the screen sharing. Sure, yeah. Okay. Patrick, yes. Okay, do you see that? Yeah, that works. Is so let's see if Rihanna is also there. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, okay, so can you try sharing for a minute? Yeah, sure. We just get everyone set uh, up. Okay, so let me check my... Then we go back to Patrick. Okay, sure. Yes, so I think it's okay. working. Yes, and then we have a small test for Paolo. Okay, Sylvia tells me that Paolo already tested it at the start. So. 
no need. Okay, so we will start in a minute with uh, with Patrick. Okay, shall I share now? Ready? Yeah, it's it's good. Thank you. And yes, if you can, you should uh, share also your video. I can see Patrick already. And I also, I don't know if I saw Adriano, but uh, turning on the video is easy enough. Sorry, unfortunately, we all get used to, to this new kind of doing meetings, so yes. Yes, that, that works, we can see you as well. <laughs> I believe it's uh, time to restart the session. I hope everyone had enough coffee. <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, the turn of uh, Patrick Knights on uh, News G, a search for light dark matter with a spherical proportional counter. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Yes, yeah, so I just want to talk about the, the News G collaboration, our project and the search for light dark matter. So I'll talk through the detector concept, uh, our first results, and then a, a discussion of uh, our current work and our, our future plans. So first, a little bit of context. Um, we've seen already exactly this <laughs> this plot, but uh, there's been a lot of effort, uh, a great effort in this this region above 10 GV in the search, uh, the direct search for dark matter. However, the lower mass region is, is much uh, more weakly constrained. And so this has attracted a lot of theoretical interest and, uh, and growing experimental interest as we've seen already in the session. Um, and so we, we, we want to explore this region. Um, and so to do that, uh, when we're thinking about the, the standard uh, nuclear recall from an elastic interaction of dark matter, we need to think about low mass uh, targets, uh, low energy thresholds and uh, favorable quenching factors. So what do I mean by these? So here in the bottom left graph, I show for a 10 GeV uh, WIMP interacting with several different targets. I've got the recoil energy on the X and on the Y axis, uh, some measure of the rate. You can see for a 10 GeV WIMP then or dark matter particle, we have favorable rates for uh, for heavier targets. However, if we start to talk about lighter matter candidates like 1 GeV, then you can see at the 1 kV uh, recoil energy, then uh, lighter targets such as hydrogen or helium uh, have much more favorable rates. Coupled with this is the, the need for a low energy threshold. So to be able to see this, obviously we have to have a very low energy threshold. And the other uh, part coupled with this is the ability to see this energy. So Obviously, not all of this energy is deposited in a, a manner we can observe and detector. So for, for the detector, I'll talk about ionization is the important one. And you can see here for various gas targets that the, the fraction of energy deposited in ionization is, uh, is much more favorable for these light targets in uh, light gases. And so this, this motivates the use of a gas, for us, a gas detector, and in particular, a spherical proportional counter. So what is this? It's a, a spherical uh, vessel. Uh, of order one meter in diameter, which we fill with a, a ver uh, with a choice of gas. And at the center, we have an order one millimeter anode, um, which we set a high voltage. So uh, at first order, this gives us a one over R squared electric field in our detector. So if you imagine a dark matter particle interacting in our gas volume, uh, generating some ionization, so some electrons, these electrons drift under the influence of the electric field towards the anode. And then within a few hundred microns of the anode, the electric field becomes high enough that these electrons can uh, induce a Townsend avalanche and we get uh, an amplification of our signal. And then the drift back of the ions from the avalanche generates a measurable signal we can see. So this is shown schematically or in a cartoon here. And then in practice, this is a, an example of one of the early uh, spherical proportional counters, um, which is a, a repurposed uh, LEP RF cavity. And here is our, our central readout. In the simplest case, we use a single anode. And so this is shown here. So this, this detector has um, various uh, uh, strengths. One of, the ones, one of them is that it's, uh, it's easy to make this detector out of radio pure materials. It's just a sphere. 
uh, with some rod here supporting the anode. These can be made out of uh, radio pure copper. Uh, the rest of the materials here are all less than a gram, uh, but even so we endeavor to make these out of radio pure materials. Another thing is the spherical geometry has the lowest surface area to volume ratio and the, even with the radio pure materials, the majority of our background comes from this, uh, this copper shell. So in a sphere, we minimize that surface. And uh, the spherical geometry also brings another advantage in terms of the capacitance and so uh, electronic noise, which allows us to get low thresholds. So the sphere compared to uh, traditional gas detector geometries like the parallel plate or, or cylinder that has the lowest capacity. And also crucially the capacity, uh, capacitance sorry, doesn't uh, scale with the size of the detector. So we can have increasing size of detector without commensurately increasing uh, capacitance. And so low noise and so low energy thresholds. One of the other powers that comes with the detector is pulse shape discrimination. So I said it's single channel readout in the simplest form, but we still have a lot of power with this. So I show here in some cartoons, some examples of interaction. So say we have a point like interaction at low radius in our detector. The primary electrons uh, are in a high field region. So we'll undergo a uh, little diffusion on their way to the anode. And so we'll arrive at the anode an avalanche uh, within a very short space of time. And this translates to a very short rise time in the signal we've measured. However, if we had a, a point like interaction occurring uh, higher radius, then we'll have more diffusion of the primary electrons. And so greater spread in arrival times translate into greater spread in rise time. Uh, further than that, if we were to have a track of ionization, say, which could be caused by say an alpha particle or a muon passing through the detector, then you'd have a much greater range in arrival times of your primary electrons at the anode and so an even higher rise time. And this is seen in practice here from uh, a test at the surface uh, using a, a smaller a 30 centimeter detector with an iron 55 source inside, which is a source of 5.9 kV X-rays. So in region one here, we see something like this. Uh, this is uh, photons interacting in the gas volume and increasing radius. At some point, they start to interact near the surface of the cathode or surface of the detector and then in this region here, uh, cosmic muons. So these are leaving tracks of ionization. And you see these are at much higher rise time. So in this way, with our pulse shape discrimination, we can uh, reject events that are track-like deposits uh, or events occurring near the cathode. And like I said, this is where the majority of our background comes from, this copper surface. So we, we, can, we can discriminate against that compared to point-like interactions, which is what we'd expect for a dark matter interacting in our detector. So, um, for the reasons above, uh, this detector is well suited for a direct dark matter search. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that, that it's a gas detector, so we can easily vary the gas uh, that we choose to operate with. We can pick light gases, uh, which are loaded with uh, high hydrogen atoms like methane, or even uh, we could use helium gas uh, to be kinematically matched with light dark matter. Uh, I said that it's single channel readout, but um, actually we're working towards um, more, more uh, uh, anodes and higher readout uh, channels, which I'll discuss later. Um, and also, I just want to mention there's many other applications uh, for this detector, such as fast neutron spectroscopy. There was a talk early today about that. And the Trinus double VTK, there's a talk tomorrow on that. So I, I won't dwell on those, but I encourage you to see those talks for other applications of this detector. And this is our, our collaboration. So we're called NewsG, New Experiments with Spheres Gas. And uh, this was us at our most recent collaboration meeting which uh, like many others ended up in Zoom instead of in Birmingham. Uh, okay, so. And then I just want to discuss uh, our first dark matter detector that we built as a collaboration. So this was a 60 centimeter spherical portal counter using uh, NOSV copper from Arubis, um, which underwent several stages of chemical cleaning to remove any possible radon deposits on the surf in the inner surface. And it's installed in the, the uh, underground lab in Modan, LSM. Uh, so you see it has this overburden here, 4,800 meters water equivalent. Um, this is a detector located inside its shielding, which is layers of copper, lead, and polyethylene. And this is the detector taking out the nice shiny uh, clean copper. Uh, and this is our readout structure. So you see the rod and the anode here, which was placed inside. Um, with this, um, this first detector, this first, uh, yeah, the first detector we built for a dark matter search, we were able to, to carry out a dark matter search and using primarily neon uh, as the target, we were able to place uh, a competitive limit. In fact, the most competitive limit, exclusion limit and 90% confidence level for a 0.5 GeV mass uh, candidate at the time. And this was done with a, a 9.6 kilogram day exposure. Um, 
so this this was really encouraging for the uh, first uh, first detector, and from there we we're progressing to the next next generation of uh, of spherical force mechanical for dark matter searches, which uh, is this one you see here. So it's it's bigger. It's a hundred and thirty centimeter detector. Um, so we have a much larger uh, volume for our gas. It's made from pure copper 4N, so 99.99% pure rubis copper. Um, and uh, it will be, it, it was constructed in, in France and first operated for a commissioning run in LSM, um, but will be installed in Snow Lab Canada. And uh, we've already had a talk from Deep, but you can see this is where we'll be, we'll be housed or are currently housed in the cube hall in Snow Lab. Another improvement with this detector is uh, an improvement in our shielding. So this is a, a sketch of the detector inside the layer of three centimeter layer of archaeological lead, the 23 centimeter layer of low activity lead, and then around that we have a layer of uh, high density polyethylene. And so I just want to talk a little bit more about the construction of the detector. So this was the a spinning one of the hemispheres to the detector out of this foreign uh, copper plate. Um, I'm sure as we all know, copper is a very attractive material for building dark matter detectors. Um, mainly because it doesn't have any long-lived radioisotopes of its own. The majority of the background in copper comes from cosmogenic uh, activation, so things like cobalt-60, but you minimise that by placing it underground. Um, other backgrounds come from the uranium and thorium decay chains, so they're naturally found in the material and also deposited by uh, radon-222 gas floating around uh, in the production environment. So traditionally, um, backgrounds were inferred or lower chain backgrounds were inferred by direct measurements of the uranium and thorium with uh, mass spectroscopy and then you infer the progeny from that. Um, however you can see from the decay chain um, most of the things after uranium and some higher up have uh, relatively short half-lives apart from lead 210. So what this means is that if you have radon 222 mixing into your copper during production and then decaying uh, you can have a broken equilibrium at this point where you have a high, high life, to, uh, half life, and so the activity you may infer from the uranium measurement uh, may not give you the the right amount for the lead two ten. So a recent in the last few years development is being able to measure the alpha particle from polonium two ten directly, which sits here in the chain, and then this is used to infer the lead two ten. Uh, and so this is a paper here by the Exmus collaboration where they use this XIA ultra low eighteen hundred detector to do this. Um, in collaboration with them, we, we had a sample of our copper uh, analysed uh, and we found that in our copper we have roughly 29 millibecquerels per kilogram of this lead 210. So this is the, the dominant uh, background source in, uh, in our experiment. One way we could mitigate that though is uh, through another interesting property of copper is that it uh, has a very high reduction potential. And what this means is that um, if you have copper ions in a solution with uh, other nuisance ions like uranium or, or potassium or something like this, uh, in an uh, they will preferentially uh, deposit at a surface. Um, so what we did is we, uh, we deposited a, an ultra pure layer of copper uh, via electroplating onto the inner surface of our detector. So this is a cartoon of the, the setups. We have our detector hemisphere here. We have some electrolyte containing copper ions and then some, some other uh, electrode here for putting a voltage across. And what we do is we put a particular voltage between these and drive a current, and this drives copper ions from solution onto the surface of our detector. So we could build up a layer of ultra pure copper to act as an inner shield to the detector to shield us from um, the decays of the, the lower uranium chain. And from a 500 micron ultra pure uh, inner layer, we estimate we reduce the background rate below one kV in our detector by approximately 70%. It's estimated from simulation. Um, so this was actually the setup of doing the electroplating. Uh, you can see here this our detector hemisphere. And this was the, uh, as a function of time, the thickness we plated, which is roughly corresponds to a rate of one, one millimeter per month. Um, following this, a sample of our, our copper was taken and, and assayed uh, with uh, a mass spectroscopy, and it's compatible with previous electroformed uh, copper samples, which you know, it was encouraging. Um, and we've prepared a, a paper for submission to NIM, which should be coming uh, very shortly um, on this. Okay, so after constructing the detector, um, uh, we uh, installed it again in LSM, uh, where we could do a commissioning run. So this allowed us to test things like uh, installing the sensor in a glove box. So here we're installing the sensor onto the rod, which goes inside the sphere. 
uh, and then to access the inside of the sphere, which should not come in contact with air um, and radon, uh, we have this glove box, uh, which is flushed with nitrogen, uh, which we use to lower in the sensor. So we're able to carry out these, these things on the detector. The other thing we were allowed to test was the, or able to test was the uh, assembly of the shielding. So this is the, the detector set inside half of its, its lead shielding. Um, and then when it was uh, installed into the shielding, we were able to take some first data uh, in LSM to test our acquisition and calibration system. The calibration system I'll discuss a bit more later, um, but we took some calibration data also with Argon 37, which, are, which we're currently looking at. And we were also able to test, uh, I'll discuss more, but uh, a new sensor technology. And the current status, so after, after being in LSM, uh, we boxed up the detector and shipped it across the sea, and it's now in Snow Lab. So this was it arriving underground um, just before, before uh, Christmas now, I suppose. Um, this is the seismic platform next to Deep, uh, where our detect detector and shielding will sit. And this is the detector wrapped up ready to be installed in the shielding. And this is our, our high density polyethylene shielding uh, assembled on the surface, uh, which I think is now underground. So we're beginning to put the pieces together underground for our detector. So now I just want to talk about some of the, the recent developments in the detector technology, which will allow us to, to, to improve on our, our previous result uh, with the spherical force counter and dark matter search. So one of these is the multi-anode sensor, which I, I touched on before. So there's a, a small limitation or a limitation with a single anode sensor in that the electric field at high radius is coupled with our gain. So the gain is the avalanche gain is determined by the size of the anode and the high voltage, but this also determines the field at high radius. So there's some, some playoff to be made there. Um, however, with this sensor, we, we get around that. So we decouple the gain in the high radius electric field by having multiple small anodes uh, equidistant from some central point. Um, so these small anodes mean that the gain is still determined by the size of the anode and the high voltage. However, at large radius, the electric field is determined by the collective electric field of, um, of all of these anodes together. And you can see if you compare the red line, which is a single anode sensor, to the blue line, which is an 11 ball sensor like this one, 11 ball Aculus, um, there's a factor of nine improvement in the electric field at high radius. Um, so we've made some recent developments in this. So we're, we're really pushing for um, high precision design and reproducibility. So we've adopted 3D printing techniques to produce this central electrode which we then um, deposit on a surface, deposit on the surface a, a diamond-like carbon layer, which allows us to, to produce an electrode we can ground or apply, apply a voltage to. Um, so there's a, a publication coming, which is under review currently uh, on these developments. Another thing we're working on is smaller anodes, uh, and which will allow us to have higher gain, or even more anodes, uh, instead of 11 having higher number of anodes, which will allow us to have a higher electric field at larger radius. Um, and also we're working on precision assembly tools like you see here. This is one we use for assembling the, the Equinos. Uh, and in the future, we, um, we'd like to also investigate how we can read out individual anodes instead of reading out these collectively or in you know, the bottom half and the top half, reading out individual anodes. And this would give us some information about the location of, uh, of uh, ionization in our detector. Uh, another crucial aspect is gas purification. So um, oxygen and water or oxygen electronegative molecules uh, can lead to electron attachment in the detector. Um, and this is a particular problem as the detector grows in size because we have weaker electric fields at the outside. Um, and so we, we may lose some of our primary electrons. So we need to filter our gas before we put it in the detector. Uh, classic way of doing this is with a getter. However, these uh, emanate radon. So in series with our, our getter, we're using radon traps. However, we found that radon traps remove methane, which is one of the critical gases uh, that we use. So if we have a mixture of gas, it may remove some of that, which is not favorable. So we're, we're investigating um, ways of filtering at both stages, uh, as well as online gas monitoring in a recirculation system. So with like a, a residual gas analyzer to monitor the quality of our gas um, during a run. Up to this point, we've been op uh, operating in a sealed mode, which is, um, which has also worked well. So test, tests are ongoing for, for these developments. Um, another uh, a key development with this detector compared to the last is the use of a laser calibration system. So we have a, a laser, uh, I see in the cartoon here, there's the detector. We have a laser 
a fiber optic going into the detector, which allows laser light to hit the surface of the detector Thank you. Um, and extract electrons down to a single electron level. Um, and with a, a second signal from the photodetector from the laser, we're able to get uh, gas property information. So things like uh, parameterizing um, drift times or even W value for the detector. And this will be running constantly throughout our data taking. So this allows us to also gain monitor. So here is uh, the laser induced peak in our detector. Here is the peak from the Argon 37 2.8 keV peak um, through the course of detection. You see there's some, some time dependent variation uh, in the gain and the amplitude of the recorded pulse here, which is probably due to temperature variations. However, with this laser induced peak, we're able to correct for that. So this is a, a powerful tool we have now. Another powerful tool uh, which we're developing is a, a complete simulation of the sphere, so a dedicated simulation framework which combines Sharp 4 and Garfield++ along with uh, finite element method uh, calculations. So just as a quick example here, again, is the Akinos sensor. Um, we read it out as a two channel, so we read the bottom five balls of the 11 here and the top six uh, as one. Um, so we, we can simulate this in a, or calculate this in a, a finite element method to find the electric field. We can feed that into our, our simulation framework in here, the weighting fields. And then the simulation framework will take us right from the primary uh, interaction of a particle all the way through to the electronics chain and the final signal we read out. So here you can see the signal generated on the six versus the five uh, anode. So this is, this is a tool we've developed. And this will allow us to also look at things like uh, uh, comparing to calibration data and also fiducialization of the detector. Uh, and all of these things come together um, for our new detector uh, to produce this, um, this uh, sensitivity projection, um, which I show here, which is for neon uh, CH4 10% uh, in this detector uh, with an exposure of 20 kilogram days. And you can see that we're, we're um, vastly improved compared to our, our previous detector. Okay, uh, just in the last 10 seconds, just to say there's also a future for this. So. I said that the majority of our background comes from the copper itself. So uh, an obvious way forward is then to completely electroform the detector. So we have um, already funding to produce a fully electroformed detector underground. So we minimize cosmogenic activation at that point. Um, and the current status is, is the R&D is underway for a prototype, a 30 centimeter prototype at the uh, PNNL in the USA. And then the full scale 140 centimeter underground uh, electroform detector will begin uh, late next year. Okay, so as I'm out of time, I, I won't read through the, uh, the summary slide. I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much also for being understanding of the time. Uh, we have a, a few minutes for questions now. Um, I might have one, if I can. So Please how the... <clears throat> How the limits change when you use the electroform copper? So uh, I don't know if I have the numbers in my backup. Uh, well, I can just say so that, like I say, the majority of our background comes from the the copper. Uh, if I remember, um, our background projection is something like uh, 1.6 DIU, um, and the majority of this comes from the copper. So I don't have the the limit here to show what we'd gain from that. But, you know, it's a Oh, let me check if I've got the table. Oh, no, sorry, I don't, I don't have the table here, but um. Okay, uh, yeah. and the uh, and in the limit, the, the pink is related to two different materials, right? Yeah, so this oh, comes okay. from the the hydrogen. This comes from the neon. Yeah, because okay, okay, yeah. great. And have you performed the? Um, so you show the um, uh, the path shape discrimination with a sphere or thirty centimeter. Have you? done the, the same study with the 60 centimeter at Modan? Uh, I'm not sure if we've done Are the it. the performance is the same? Like yeah, well, I don't know if we've done it with Modan, but we've done it with a 140 centimeter uh, repurposed um, ah. uh, cavity on, 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 uh, on the surface. And we, we can see the same, same picture. Okay. Mm. Okay. Thank I have a couple of questions as well, unless there's hands there. But I don't see any hands at the moment. Um, so the first question is, if you have any plans to look for other kinds of signals in the same uh, similar mass range, or this is something that you'll think about later? Right, so I think this is something that's um, being looked at. I know that um, also um, 
uh, one of the collaborators is looking at, say, a different type of dark matter. So he's looking for clues of Klein axions and sensitivity to that. Um, but yeah, um, I think we're, we're looking into other, instead of the traditional nuclear recall, into other, other possibilities as well. But you don't plan to make any modifications to your detector to optimize uh, with respect to that? Not, not for this detector, as, a, as far as I'm aware, but this is something we could look at for future detectors. Okay, thanks. And then the second question is, uh, how do you plan to, to treat the neutrino background once you get to 20? Is it maybe a bit early, but... Sorry, when, you, you mean when we approach... When you approach the neutrino background uh, levels, I mean the neutrino floor, if this is something that is very far future, I guess. But yeah, you... so this would be very far in the future. Yeah. So, but for you know, for two two detectors down the line, uh, one could think. Um, then you'd need maybe because in in this region, the majority of the neutrino floor, I suppose, comes from the solar neutrino. So you'd need some kind of directionality, which we could get through the through the Akinos sensor. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, virtual round of applause as well. And uh, move on to the next talk. Yeah, so we can move ahead with the next talk. Uh, Adriano Di Giovanni, if you would like to start sharing. Yes. Thanks. And he will lead a discussion about Darwin experiment, the ultimate direct uh, detector for direct matter search. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we can see this okay, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, attending this uh, presentation. Uh, actually, I'm going to talk about the Darwin Observatory on behalf of the Darwin collaboration. So Darwin uh, is, uh, is mainly uh, a dark matter detector. It's basically the last hope we have uh, to detect dark matter uh, with a non-directional detector in uh, the uh, mass range between 10 GB up to 1, 1 TV. Uh, it can also cover a quite diverse uh, science, uh, science program, but uh, more than that uh, is a, 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 a ch very challenging enterprise. Because if we put together Darwin, then we'll be dealing with the largest liquid xenon targets ever ever built on, uh, on Earth. And uh, uh, so we are talking about 50, 50 tons of, uh, of xenon. Then we need to uh, also uh, deal with the level of cleanliness that uh, we require in order to operate the detector. And, uh, and last but not least, we need to carefully plan a strategy for buying the xenon because we are talking about the yearly worldwide production of, of xenon. So you, you need to uh, uh, plan over the time the acquisition of, of the xenon. So Darwin is, uh, uh, is one of the experiments that will be uh, exploiting the effects of a wind interaction with the, the uh, nucleus of a target. Uh, namely, uh, by by using the light and uh, the charge channel. So I'm sure that you already uh, seen this uh, uh, this slide many times. So the idea is that is to use these two information to build a a, a rejection uh, a rejection a, a discrimination proce procedure in order to uh, discriminate the uh, the two families, uh, the electron electron recoil family in which we expect to see the background and uh, uh, the nuclear recoil uh, induced event family in which, uh, in which we expect uh, to see the dark matter interaction. Uh, the procedure is, is quite standard. So Darwin is a large TPC. So the idea is that uh, you have a, a WIMP that uh, interact with the nucleus of, of the target. Then you, have, you get a, a, a prompt scintillation that we call S1. At the same time, you have electrons that can be drifted up uh, by means of uh, an electric field that is, uh, that is uh, active in, in the TPC. And once you get uh, the uh, gas phase, you get a second signal that we call delayed scintillation. It's actually an electroluminous process that is proportional to the charge. So by playing with S1 and S2, you built your, uh, uh, let's say, uh, rejection algorithm. 
and you do some uh, very, very nice pulse shape discrimination, but also you can actually record the, the uh, positioning in X, Y of the event. Uh, and you can, go, you can also get the information of the depth uh, by measuring the uh, arrival time distance between uh, this S1 signal and the S2 signal. So you get information about the position, about the uh, kind of, uh, of particle that you are dealing with. So this comes from the Xenon collaboration. And as you can see, we have two uh, defined separate uh, and separate families of, uh, of event in the space of S1 and S2 in, in photoelectron units. Um, Xenon, uh, sorry, Darwin uh, will be, uh, uh, will naturally follow the Xenon legacy. Uh, this project uh, is now leading the dark matter search in uh, the, the parameter, uh, these parameters since uh, many years now. And uh, the Xenon collaboration is, uh, is actually commissioning the last, uh, the last uh, and the biggest detector ever, Xenon and Tone, and, will, uh, and the collaboration will start taking that up very, very, very soon. So we have a benchmark, and uh, if we want to do uh, better than the benchmark, we need to be bigger, and we need to be cleaner, and we need to take care of a lot of things. Uh, so the TPC is, uh, is huge, so the diameter is uh, 2.6 meters, and, uh, and so the uh, drift length. So uh, we will need uh, uh, we will need a, a, a neutron muon veto. And uh, of course, we need to uh, carefully choose the uh, materials that uh, we uh, want to use to build the cryostat and the detector it, itself. So about the time scale, uh, we are expected uh, to start data, taking data uh, sometime in 2027, so seven years from, uh, from now, that looks like tomorrow. And the um, project structure is uh, quite, uh, quite common. The scientific community is uh, consists of uh, 160 scientists uh, from 29 institutions and 12 countries. Uh, we already have in place uh, uh, working, active working groups that are actually uh, studying uh, options and solutions for the uh, construction of uh, the detector and for the physics of the detector. And uh, uh, I, I have the privilege and the burden of uh, being the um, convener of the working group number five. So the working group that deals with the uh, light charge sensor and readout for Darwin. So I don't have time to go through all the uh, R&D activities of each working group. So the easiest for me is to just to give you the sense of what we are doing in our working group. So as the entire world uh, is doing, so we are, we are also extensively studying uh, silicon photomultipliers and see whether these are a good these devices are a good option to replace uh, our our benchmark that is of course the the, the pmt that uh, xenon is using for for the xenon and tone uh, so several groups are working on uh, silicon photomultipliers and uh, but all of this it's uh, it's I, I mean to my understanding we are not yet uh, ready to use silicon photomultiplier for dark matter experiments, at least liquid xenon based. Um, uh, uh, there are also uh, like a spin-off of silicon photomultiplier. So there is a group working in digital and developing digital CPM. And uh, this is very preliminary. I mean, the, this uh, uh, part, this the left side of the slides. So in Heidelberg, they are testing the capability of being able to switch off, switch off the noise, the noises pixel of a silicon photomultiplier. So uh, basically, in this plot, you see that by switching off five percent of the pixel, meaning that uh, your photodetection efficiency becomes five percent less. Uh, so you lose five five percent in terms of photon detection efficiency, but then you gain uh, something like a factor 1000 in, in terms of dark counting rate that at the moment is the killer for, for uh, uh, this, uh, this application. We also have an effort in trying to build uh, a, a suitable electronics for kerogenic environment uh, with the idea of merging together, of coupling together many channels and operating them as a single, as a single channel. 
uh, we are also looking at uh, hybrid uh, uh, detectors. So for example, on the left, uh, you have the vacuum silicon photomultiplier tubes developed by INFN Naples. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, you combine the best quality of uh, PMT, so the, the, the sides, basically, uh, with the, the, the fantastic and distinctive uh, uh, single photo detection resolution of a silicon photomultipliers. Uh, of a silicon photomultiplier, yes. Uh, on, on the right, we have a ballone uh, that's, uh, again, a quite, uh, it's not super new, but uh, now I think it's, uh, it's actually in, this technology is improving a lot. And this will offer a huge uh, sensitive, uh, uh, I mean, a huge coverage for your target. And uh, the readout uh, will be done by using a, um, a scintillating layer that will convert the electron into a flash of light and a silicon photomultiplier. So we are considering uh, several, several options for, uh, for assembling the, the, the detection uh, array of Darwin, uh, but at the moment I think uh, the PMT is uh, the best candidate. Uh, Darwin again is a dark matter detector, so we look for very rare events, and when you look for very, very, very rare events, uh, your, uh, your fight is against uh, uh, the background. So we uh, uh, actually, what I'm showing now, it's a simulation. Uh, but it's a simulation with the, less, the lesson we learned from uh, uh, the, all the former uh, experiments like Xenon, like LZ, like all the other experiments that uh, uh, are dealing with uh, liquid Xenon. So uh, we try to, uh, um, to identify the main source of the nuclear recoil uh, background and the electro recoil induced background. So as you can see on, uh, on this uh, um, chart, on this pie chart, uh, the, main the main contribution comes from the cryostat, even though we are selecting titanium as uh, one of the cleanest uh, titanium that you can find on the market from the Teflon and of course from the PMT. To me, the only reason to replace the PMT is, uh, is because the radioactivity. Uh, what's, uh, what is the goal of uh, of, of our job is actually to run a detector in which uh, of which background is uh, neutrino induced event dominated. So we want to keep under control the, 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 the main sources of the ground. So the intrinsic background, namely the, what is inside the xenon and, uh, and, and the material. For example, in this plot, you, you see that uh, we are actually considering a, a quite low concentration of krypton and, and of, uh, of radon, because we think, at least looking at what xenon is doing, that this kind of parameters can be kept uh, under control. Uh, and then there is a nice story about uh, the Xenon 136. Um, so the Xenon target, it's actually a mixture of uh, nine isotopes. And uh, what the Xenon 136 is a bit annoying because it's a double beta emitter. So in principle, you can actually ask for a depleted target, but then you uh, lose the power of doing some neutrino less double beta decay search. So it's a uh, it's matter of trade-off. So considering this, uh, this uh, contribution, if we can, uh, uh, if we are happy with this contribution, then the, uh, the electron recoil background will be dominated by proton, um, the, the neutrinos from the TP chain from the uh, beryllium-7. Of course, we'll be very much sensitive to uh, solar neutrinos. The coherent uh, neutrino nuclear scattering is, uh, as you uh, no uh, killer for uh, for this kind of, of detectors, uh, but we'll be also able to see uh, neutrinos from the helium proton uh, chain, from uh, the diffuse supernova background, and uh, also atmospheric neutrino, even though all these contributions are uh, quite suppressed by the uh, solar neutrino interaction. So if we put together all these ingredients, uh, we, we can see that uh, Darwin will be filling the voids uh, uh, left between the uh, present and the next future uh, experiments and the neutrino, the neutrino floor. Uh, then a, a, another nice feature of, uh, of Xenon. So as I said, uh, we have nine isotopes inside the target and uh, two of them uh, 
actually are non-zero uh, as have non-zero spin and uh, so if you have something that has non-zero spin as non-zero spin you can actually uh, uh, test uh, spin dependent models for dark matter so in these two plots the one on the left is mainly for protons the other on the other on the right is for neutrons uh, actually report uh, the predicted limit for darwin assuming an exposure of 200 tons per, per year so uh, xenon and ton is missing, but the, the curve will be some, somewhere in, in between xenon one ton and Darwin. We'll be also uh, sensitive to solar action and action-like particles. Um, so these uh, plots uh, actually comes from a quite old paper that we are trying to update uh, this, these days. Uh, and uh, in order to put in context the last uh, result from the xenon one ton, uh, this plot is very preliminary, so it shouldn't be here, but just to give you the idea of, uh, of uh, where, where we are. So xenon one ton, uh, the measurement is uh, about here, while Darwin will be, uh, will be here. Um, yes, so what happened if, uh, we fail. So what happens if the uh, dark matter is hiding behind the neutrino floor? So we still have uh, uh, some something to do uh, because as I said, uh, the Xenon 136 can be used uh, to test uh, neutrinoless, neutrinoless double beta decay. Again, in order to run this analysis, you need to carefully uh, know uh, the background of your, of your detector. And again, the cryostats, the Teflon, and the PMT are the main contribution to, 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 to the background for this kind of analysis. So what you can do, you can just uh, uh, do some uh, feed neutralization of your, of your volume. And then you realize that uh, in, if, you, if you take in account five ton feed neutralization, then the number of its spurious events uh, becomes uh, small. Five ton, it's not, uh, a magic number, but uh, it's when uh, the uh, material induced background equals uh, the intrinsic background. Again, in this analysis, we are considering a very low level of uh, radon 222 contamination, so at the level of 0 0.1 microbecquerel per kilogram of xenon. And uh, of course, we cannot use a, 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 a depleted uh, target, otherwise we lose our capability of doing uh, the trinos beta decay. And uh, as you can see here, there is a quite annoying contribution, namely the xenon 137, that uh, xenon 137, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, not occurring naturally. So it's uh, actually something that uh, is uh, produced when uh, a muon interacts with, uh, with the rock or with the shielding of your experiment, produce a neutron. The neutron is then absorbed by the xenon, one, uh, the xenon 136, uh, and then you have a beta decay. And so this electron will, uh, will uh, uh, mess up with your, with, your, with your detector. And this will, uh, will, uh, will simply add a continuous spectrum in the background that is quite uh, uh, annoying. Um, but then you also have the cesium 137, but the tanks, uh, I mean, the decay time is, uh, is very long. So you don't, don't, don't care the, about the decay of the cesium 137. Um, that said, so the, 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 the presence of the xenon 137 strongly depends on the neutrino flux. So in, in principle, you have two handles to mitigate this, uh, this effect. Either you go uh, deeper underground, so uh, the muon flux is, uh, is actually reduced, or you built the dream of every physicist, so the, the, the famous 4 pi uh, veto, in which you tag, you tag all the muons, not only the muon that eat your muon veto, the water tank of your detector, but all the muons, because you, you are actually sensitive to the neutrons that can be, uh, can be uh, produced by the muon, the muon interaction. So we did this... Uh, exercise of uh, uh, considering the Darwin baseline, meaning that uh, uh, the Darwin baseline contains the uh, all the, the background model is the one that I was talking about a few slides ago, plus uh, its installation at the Gran Sasso National Laboratory. 
So we, we study the background in the, uh, the region of interest in which we expect to see some uh, neutrino less double beta decay. And then we did the exercise of adding a 0 0.5 counts per year signal. So you will see a small excess uh, in, the, in, the, in the plot that will, uh, will uh, pinpoint to the, uh, the, the possible uh, neutrino less double beta decay. Of course, this can be improved by going deep underground or uh, improving the uh, the cleanliness of the, of your of your detector and then you start being competitive with other and dedicated experiments of course we'll be also sensitive to uh, electron to sorry to solar neutrinos uh, via uh, via electro scattering electron scattering um, so if we focus, uh, for example, the neutrino of proton-proton uh, chain, um, that is uh, this curve in this plot. So in this plot, we have all the components, so background and also neutrino from other processes uh, happening in the sun. And if you zoom this, uh, this, uh, this plot, you see that the, um, the Proton, the, the PP uh, neutrinos are already above uh, the, 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 the background that again is mainly driven by the Xeno-137. This analysis would really profit of having uh, a depleted target, uh, but, uh, and, and also, but again, this is uh, done for considering natural targets. So if we uh, run the, uh, the experiment, then we could actually uh, say something about uh, the survival probability of the electron neutrino in, in an energy uh, re region that, is, that should be the lowest ever, ever tested. And also we can, we can actually uh, say something about uh, the mixing angle and, uh, and uh, as a function of the uh, exposure and natural or depleted, uh, or depleted targets. Uh, last uh, but not least, uh, again, uh, so the CNS neutrino is a killer for, uh, is a killer background for dark matter search, uh, but uh, we can actually, uh, we'll be able to, to measure it and um, and, uh, and as well as uh, neutrinos from supernova. So in this paper of a collaborator of us, uh, we uh, actually demonstrated that uh, we'll get a uh, five sigma significance up to 65 kiloparsec distant uh, uh, supernova explosion. Again, so I'm, I think time's, time is a concern. So I'll uh, leave you with uh, the conclusion of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adriano. Are there any questions? Bjorn. Please. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now. Sorry, I was double muted. Yeah, I have a question about the background. You showed the simulation where you have 30% PTFE, 30% PMTs. Are these based on uh, uh, which steps are you? assuming you are in Gran Sasso? Yes, so the baseline is in Gran Sasso and actually we are using, uh, I would say, the database of uh, the, sc the screened material of uh, former experiment like Xenon, like LZ. For the PMT, yeah. is the, the baseline is the uh, PMT of Xenon 1 tone. So given that you have so much PTFE and so much background, would moving, is this mostly neutron-induced background from the fluor? or what are the backgrounds or outgassing? Um, so the, the, the problem, the problem of PTF, PTF uh, it can be either. So can, can I, I didn't run this simulation, but I think it's uh, actually, um, it's art, so the ingredients are both. So outgassing and also the, uh, the surface contamination of PTF. That is a mm -hmm. known problem. Okay, is it possible to replace the Tyvek in the PTC or not? Sorry, say again? Can we replace this with Tyvek in the TPC or not? Um, I would say yes. So again, so the project is, is yet to be uh, created. I mean, we have already, 
everything in place. So there is a letter of intent, but the detector is not yet there. So I think we have time to 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 work out this. Uh, uh, let's say to deal with this uh, large contribution of uh, of the ground. In principle, I think so. Thank you. So we might have time for another quick question. If not, we will move to the next speaker. Okay, so let's move ahead. Thank you again, Adriano. Thank you, my pleasure. So stop sharing. All right, so if uh, the next speaker, Paolo, wants to share. Yep. Let's, oh, sorry. Oh, the camera is good. Let me share. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes, so. Yeah. First, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so I'm going to um, report about the latest results from the Dark Side 50 experiment um, at uh, Gran Sasso. Um, Dark Side 50 is a um, liquid argon experiment searching for, uh, for WIMPs. And the detector design is a um, basically is, is a dual phase TPC. We've seen also in the, in the previous talk as uh, how this um, detector configuration um, is ideal in order to address some of the challenges for, for these kind of searches. And uh, here I'm talking about the, uh, the scalability of the target, um, the ionization and scintillation hills, which enables to um, have relatively low uh, thresholds, how such a detector allows for 3D vertex reconstruction, um, which can be exploited in order to um, reject uh, uh, surface events or uh, multi-sided uh, uh, ones, as well as um, how they allow for uh, particle identification in order to uh, reject uh, uh, backgrounds. So um, a quick uh, recap of the um, working principle of a dual phase TPC, whatever interacts uh, uh, in, the, in the bulk of the, of the uh, target produces both um, prompt scintillation, which is detected by arrays of uh, photodetectors, as well as uh, um, ionization charges, which are drifted upwards up to uh, a gaseous region where they are extracted and uh, accelerated. And there they produce a secondary um, light emission, which is proportional to the number of, uh, of charges. So the, the time difference between the two scintillation pulses provides the, the vertical coordinate of the event. Um, while the light pattern on the top array of PNTs provides the localization in the uh, XY uh, plane. So as I said, Dark Side 50 is a um, dual phase TPC, which is operated uh, since 2013 at Gran Sasso. It is filled with a, a relatively small target, 50 kilograms of argon, which is extracted from uh, underground. And um, I will come back on this uh, later. Uh, it, the, the, the core of the detector, the TPC, is installed uh, inside a 30-ton liquid scintillator Vita, um, which is, provides basically 4 pi um, detection for, for uh, radiogenic neutrons. And oh, the whole system is placed in turn inside a one kiloton water Cherenkov detector for uh, muons. The S1 and S2 yields of the TPC are in the order of seven photoelectrons per kV with the field on for S1 and 23 photoelectrons per extracted electron um, for, for S2. The electron lifetime is uh, um, quite good, uh, actually much larger compared to the maximum uh, drift uh, um, time of electrons in the, in the vertical direction, which is limited by the small size of the TPC. Uh, it's only 36 uh, uh, centimeters. So one of the main um, um, aspect of, of Dark Side 50, of course, is the, the use of uh, um, liquid argon, which is, sorry about that, which is, um, which allows for rejection of uh, um, electronic coil background, thanks to the uh, so-called pie shape discrimination. This, tech, this technique is based on the different time characteristics of the scintillation pulse, the, the S1 signal. Um, which is different for nuclear recoils, which is the, the, the typical signature respected for WIMPs and, and also neutron, uh, and beta and gamma uh, backgrounds. So if I plot the, the fraction um, of the S1 signal in the first uh, um, tens of nanosecond of the signal itself, 
here in this plot on the top left is shown as a function of um, of the of, of of the S1 signal itself, which scales with the with the energy. One can see and one can separate pretty neatly uh, the, the the two population of nuclear recoils at the top of the uh, detector uh, from the one of electron recoils at the at the bottom. At nuclear recoil energies of the order or uh, of about um, a few tenths of uh, um, nuclear uh, of the uh, kV. So this, of course, uh, guarantees a separation and a background uh, uh, rejection of the order of ten to the nine. We have a talk um, in the after the break from the from the deep collaboration, which we'll discuss this more in uh, um, uh, more in detail. The second um, feature of the SI fifty, which um, um, contributes to the background mitig mitigation is the ability to actively reject uh, uh, neutrons and, um, and gammas, actually. Um, we can do that by uh, tagging events where uh, a particle is interacted multiple times inside the target, and this will show up um, as an event with multiple S2 signals. Um, um, but and in particular for neutrons, uh, the presence of this four pi liquid scintillator veto around the, 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 um, the, 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 the main target can be used in order to uh, tag events where uh, a neutron has interacted only once in the sensitive target and then um, has left the TPC but has been captured um, on the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the veto, depositing energy there. So the beta is constructed such as a very high neutron capture cross-section uh, probability thanks to the loading with the natural boron. And this means that looking at the coincidence between TPC and beta, one can tag this sort of um, events. The third um, um, feature of the XI-50 in terms of background mitigation is the use of uh, uh, argon um, extracted from, uh, from underground. Uh, the reason is that atmospheric argon is pretty radioactive at the level of about one becquerel per kilo uh, due to cosmogenic um, activation in the, in the atmosphere. And this is a limiting factor in uh, um, the size of uh, dual phase DPCs, uh, which cannot exceed the, the tone scale as otherwise would be um, limited by, by pile up uh, if using an uh, atmospheric argon. So the solution, and then demonstrated by the XI-50, is to extract argon from underground uh, sources, uh, which has been shielded from cosmic rays during thousands of years, and thus it is depleted from uh, argon-39 that decays away with a half-life of uh, 270 years. Uh, so the, the uh, XI-50 was filled with uh, an underground argon field in um, uh, 2015, and one can see here the comparison between the spectrum acquired with the atmospheric argon in blue and the underground argon in, uh, in red. The, the, um, the result of a multivariate feat, which I'm going to, to mention also later, reports a depletion which is larger than a factor of 1000, um, enabling uh, the, the, the future um, of the liquid argon program, uh, which was also mentioned in one talk yesterday, the XI 20K. Um, and um, the other thing that I want to mention is the fact that this feat result reported the presence of some unexpected Krypton 85 component, which may reveal the, the, uh, uh, um, an infiltration of error, meaning that the actual content of 39 argon is maybe even uh, smaller than uh, what reported here. Okay, so these three features uh, that I described on that side were all um, fundamental for the um, physics uh, results of the, of the experiment. The first one that I want to mention is the high mass WIMP uh, analysis, um, which was performed with a, um, actually a blind analysis published in, uh, uh, in 2018. So the idea was to blind and to apply this blinding mask on the uh, data sets that we collected of more than 500 days. This is once again, the pulse shape discrimination parameter versus the uh, S1 signal. And we expect nuclear coil uh, underneath this blinding mask while electronic coils are uh, here. So the, the, the idea is to um, derive, um, uh, is to identify the boundaries of a wind search region in which we minimize the background and we set a limit of 0.1 events in the full exposure while maximizing the acceptance to, uh, to nuclear coils. So we have, uh, in order to train our 
uh, selection criteria and uh, the boundaries of the uh, win per OI, we have access to uh, calibration data and to a preliminary 70 days uh, data set collected at the beginning of the um, data taking. So this table on the bottom represents the background budget um, for the full exposure before the box was open. Uh, it includes degraded alphas that can leak into the wind search region from the um, high energy side. It includes cosmogenic and radiogenic neutrons, which have been um, extensively modeled and, and simulated. And especially um, electron recoils, which may leak from the electron recoil band to the uh, nuclear recoil one. So what I'm going to show here is a quick animation where you can see the boundaries of the wind search region and the, the cut flow in, uh, and the effect of each of the cuts uh, in order uh, that were applied in order to clean the, the data set. This is the, the result after the last cut based on uh, um, um, TPC variables is applied. So we have still two events in the wind search region, but those disappear when we look at the coincidence with the, uh, with the veto, uh, leaving us with uh, um, no events in the um, wind search region and a, and a background free exposure of uh, more than 500 days. This is the acceptance, the cumulative acceptance of the uh, various cuts. So these results um, demonstrated the, 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 the potential of liquid argon um, to perform background free searches. Um, the extracted 90% confidence limit is not, sorry about that, is not uh, really competitive with xenon based searches due to the small mass, uh, but it's shown in this plot with the, with the red line. I'm also showing once again that the, the deep uh, 3600 exclusion, which will be uh, discussed later, and the xenon uh, results, uh, which are much uh, stronger. Of course, the plan for the next generations so of both xenon and liquid argon is to fill this gap um, and to reach the, the, the neutrino floor in the next decade uh, or so. The second um, item that I want to discuss are the uh, results in the low energy side um, of, the, of the spectrum, uh, which demands a totally different uh, approach, uh, especially below 3 kV electron equivalent um, recoil energy. In fact, we cannot uh, access the scintillation signal because the probability for it to trigger the detector is, uh, is very small. So we need to rely on the ionization only um, signal. This means that we lose the, the fiducialization, at least in the vertical direction, of course, there is no S1, um, and there is no discrimination of uh, uh, electronic oil background. However, we can uh, benefit from the multiplication in, uh, in the gas, as I mentioned earlier, a factor of 20 or so, which enables a very low um, threshold and a trigger efficiency, which is basically 100% even for events um, um, for ionization events, which um, produce only a couple of uh, ionization electrons. So this trigger efficiency is estimated with a full uh, optical uh, Monte Carlo, which is based on uh, um, our understanding, our model of the S2 signal, um, uh, which is fitted from a sample of uh, high energy. And by the way, it, it plateaus here at about 0.42 um, because we are still able to fiducialize in the radial direction based on uh, um, the light pattern on the, on the top array of uh, uh, photodetectors. Um, we need a calibration um, in this energy range. And this is done thanks to the presence of uh, um, Argon 37, which was not, not actually uh, planned. Um, we found argon-37, which uh, whose origin is probably cosmogenic activation during the shipment of uh, underground argon to, uh, to Gran Sasso. It decays away in, uh, um, in a few months, uh, but at the beginning of the data taking, it shows up with these two uh, nice peaks uh, centered around 2.8 kV and extending down to 270 um, EVs. Um, Below 270 V, of course, we need to extrapolate uh, to calibrate the, the lower energy part. So the energy scale is combined uh, uh, with um, a background model derived for the high mass wind search in order to derive the, 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 um, the background model for the um, uh, low energy side. Uh, for the high mass background model, we relied on um, a full simulations of each radioactive component, namely um, the, 
the chi chains and, and the major um, contaminants, uh, including the internals, argon-39 and krypton, in all the detector materials. And we applied a multivariate fit, which exploits not only the energy of the reconstructed event, but also the, the position. So we extrapolate this down to uh, low energy. Um, and I remind you that we are talking about uh, this model is covering really a wide uh, energy range while the, the, the searches are concentrated only in the first few bins of this uh, plot. The next step is the calibration of nuclear recoils uh, down to the KV uh, energy scale uh, and below. Uh, compared to electron recoils, of course, we need to consider also um, the quenching due to nuclear collisions, which adds one degree of freedom. Uh, in order to do so, we fit uh, an effective model, which takes into account both the quenching and the recombination probability, to data from uh, neutron sources. Those neutron sources are dipped into the detector. Uh, they're placed close to the cryostat. And uh, we have two of them, americium carbon and americium beryllium. The fits are shown uh, here on the, on the right plots. And we're also using data from external um, experiments, which are typically uh, done with neutron sources, at fixed energy in order to further constrain um, the, 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 um, our fit. And this is the resulting ionization yield as a function of the recoil energy. As you can see that the uh, systematic error is pretty uh, large. This is the final data set in the energy range, which spans from uh, zero to roughly three uh, kV electron recoil equivalent. Um, the data is shown here, and the, the, the feet with Monte Carlo components are uh, the colored lines here. We have, of course, a, a dominant contribution at um, very low energy, uh, which is not modeled. This is why uh, we set um, a minimum threshold for the analysis at about uh, four uh, reconstructed electrons. Superimposed, there are also expected um, spectra. Uh, PDFs for um, low mass WIMPs from uh, uh, roughly 2 to 10 uh, JV. And this analysis allowed us to set um, very stringent limits on the WIMP nuclear cross section, uh, which at the time were um, uh, leading uh, between 2 and 6 uh, uh, JV uh, WIMP masses. Now, uh, um, the, the, the Xenon experiments, Xenon and Tom provided a slightly stronger limits in this range. And also, um, we have um, published an interpretation of this result also in the terms in a, a for a concern, the uh, WIMP electron uh, coupling. Those results are shown on the, um, on the right. So can we do better? And uh, yes, uh, in, in, this, uh, in the past year, we have been working on improving these results. First of all, we have a larger statistics, almost a factor of two. Um, the, the, the 2018 uh, data set. We've been working hard in order to improve the data selection uh, in order to both recover acceptance for certain classes of events, which were uh, wrongly um, neglected in the first analysis, and also to improve the rejection of uh, pathological or unmodeled uh, ones. As an example, for these two um, uh, categories, I'm showing here at the top, um, a typical S1 plus S2 event where the time difference between the two is corresponds to the maximum drift. In this case, uh, this is an event located at the bottom of the TPC. We have S1 and the ionization energy or the uh, energy of the event is reconstructed using the, um, the second pulse correctly. There are, however, cases where um, the um, the topology of the event is such that the S2 signal is the one that triggers the detector because S1 is very small. And we were wrongly reconstructing the energy of the event using the, the second pulse, which is instead a photoionization um, signal uh, produced by the uh, scintillation um, of the, um, in, in, in the gas. So we are recovering acceptance for these classes of events. Um, which were inducing a uh, slight bias in the, in the data spectrum, as well as for events where S1 and S2 are uh, in pile up, as shown in the uh, middle of schematics. We're also improving uh, the background modeling. Um, the first uh, um, item that I want to mention is that we are extending it above 50 electrons. This means that uh, we can constrain better uh, the background above uh, um, 
a region where we, we don't expect any, any more signal. If I remember, um, a 10 GV WIMPs um, only produces signals up to 80 uh, electrons or so. And we also have more accurate PDFs, for example, uh, we separated the contribution, the terminal contribution of argon-39 from krypton-85. Um, we also have improved calibration, both for the nuclear recoil uh, energy scale and for the electron recoil ones. And these allow us to disentangle, for example, detector effects from uh, the intrinsic fluctuations of the signal and the energy scale. Um, one can see, for example, here on the bottom plot, this is the equivalent of the electron recoil calibration with the argon-37. We are now able to reproduce all the features of the uh, signal, which are induced by um, detector non-uniformities and which were firstly uh, averaged uh, out. So the overall effect of this is a reduction of the systematic uncertainty. And uh, this improvement in the modeling of the signal together with the, um, the larger statistics and an improved calibration um, will bring a significant improvement in the um, exclusion limit for, li for light uh, wimp nucleon, um, for, for light uh, wind masses. Um, so unfortunately, I am unable to show any preliminary result because they are still being uh, finalized, but um, we really expect a significant improvement. As before, the same data can be used to constrain other sort of interactions with uh, uh, electron final states um, and, and or, for example, actions. Something else that we are working on is the implementation of the Migdal effect that was already mentioned in a, in a talk yesterday. Um, and uh, it may significantly um, enhance the sensitivity to um, uh, low, one, low, low mass uh, WIMPs. Uh, so what, are, what we're working on at the moment is an implementation where we uh, conserve the correlation between the nuclear recoil energy um, and the electron recoil energy. On, uh, um, and, and we plan to, pr to produce uh, PDFs for the signal, which take care, uh, which account for, for both the effects uh, considered as uh, independent. This work is done in collaboration with uh, theorists, and um, we, we will, it will also be finalized very soon. Um, my last slide is on a result, which is um, indeed instead finalized and published, is an interpretation of the IMAS WIMP uh, non result in the framework of uh, effective field theories. Um, what we show here is that, uh, well, we are used to compare um, exclusion limits from different targets in, uh, in the framework of the, the standard scalar interaction, but there are um, 15 operators that may describe the, the, the wind nuclear interaction. And um, if one consider, um, um, and, and, and one can, can interpret exclusion limits um, um, assuming a, a different kind of interactions. This is what is shown here. And for more details, uh, you have to refer to this. Uh, I, I, I suggest you to open this, this publication. It shows how uh, there are important variations up to a factor uh, 100, um, um, only for uh, considering our case of, of argon 39. And this, of course, points in the direction of um, uh, highlighting the importance of complementarity especially in the, in the case of a positive um, observation uh, in order to probe the full uh, parameter space. So I think I am uh, out of time. So I will leave the conclusion here and thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we have time uh, for a couple of questions and then uh, as highlighted in the slides, uh, many of the speakers have Zoom discussion rooms that uh, are open after the, the session closes. You can find them on the agenda as well. So, is there any questions from the from the audience? Mm. If not, I will uh, ask one. So, I'm curious about the, your the statistical analysis that you're using for for setting the limits. So, do you do you do a in Babin likelihood with the signal hypothesis in the background, or is it something different? Yes, I assume you're referring to the low mass wind search, and this is exactly the case. So we have background uh, predictions that are constrained both in uh, uh, shape and in rate, um, and we test uh, our signal hypothesis 
Um, we have a couple of systematics um, which are included, namely on the um, scaling of the backgrounds and on the energy scale uh, calibration, which are represented by the bands, which I show here. So this is, for example, for, elect for nuclear recoils. Um, so one of the reasons why we expect a big improvement is that we, we improved um, this calibration by um, a significant amount and we reduced the systematics on the uh, nuclear equal calibration. And do you have a, a like, like how much in this plot, in this kind of, uh, this kind of projection, how much does the reducing a systematic gain you? Um, I cannot answer in the sense that I don't know what is the effect of simply reducing the systematics. Okay, I don't know if you have run the with and without the systematic, but this is just a curiosity. Um, I will have to check. It's not. It's not. It's not trivial to. Yeah. to answer. No worries. Right. It's probably time for one more question. If anyone has it. If not, uh, virtual applause again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we can move to the next speaker. Which is coffee break, I guess. Right. I forgot. <laughs> coffee break. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, then, so the next uh, session will restart. Let me just check on the agenda. Uh, so we're starting 15 minutes then.
Um, if now is online, would you mind start the <clears throat> testing sharing? Uh, I can't do that until the, okay, there we go. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Okay. Sorry, I'm. No, that's okay. Does that look correct? Perfect. Yes. Try the second slide just to make sure that. Yeah. Great. And would you mind to have then your video on when you? Oh yeah. It, just just when you uh, when you talk. Just make sure it oh. looks okay. Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, do you get the net? Yeah, actually, how do I see myself now? Uh, okay, so if it's uh, disturbing, then turn it off. I don't know how. No, I can't even see myself. So as long as I'm like in frame and. Yeah, you're great. Okay. And if um, maybe we still have two minutes, if Sergio is there. I know that Simone already tried the sharing. So if uh, Sergio, uh, I don't see him anymore. So I hope you will connect later. Okay. So one minute left before restarting the session. Okay, so it's uh, 30, noon 30, Eastern. So I think we can resume the, the session and I will restart the recording. So we will start the last uh, session of uh, this parallel of today. And the first speaker is uh, Noah Kurinsky from Fermilab, and he will talk about supersymmetric searches for low mass uh, particle dark matter. So Noah, I'll give it to you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Sylvia. Um, yeah, so this is a fairly broad topic, and um, I included a bunch of archive links where possible. I, I posted my Zoom info at the end for, for uh, detailed questions because I'm going to be skipping through things fairly quickly. We've done a lot in the two years since the last ICHEP, but even in the last three months, we've, we've published a lot of new dark matter results. So I'll talk very, very briefly about the technical challenges because they've been covered many times in this session already, and then move to the, the results we published and then talk a bit about what we're doing both in the next year as well as um, with Super CDMS Snow Lab. Um, so as many people noted, right, this is the normal um, uh, particle dark matter cross-section versus mass space you're used to seeing. And there's generically these low mass and high mass regions where um, in the high mass region, really you're limited by uh, exposure, whereas most of the, the low mass experiments, exposure is important, but um, it's very threshold driven. Um, and what I also wanted to highlight is, you know, in the last few years, these regions are also broken down based on um, uh, coupling probed. And so the low mass region below about 10 GeV and about uh, 1 keV in recoil energy also happens to be the region in which um, kinematics of recoiling off of electrons is actually more favorable than recoiling off nucleons and where you flip from um, preferring a heavier target to get more um, recoil energy from a given interaction to a lighter target um, to reduce the kinematic mismatch between your target and the dark matter. So um, this is just generic scaling, but um, in CDMS we use silicon um, and germanium. So silicon would be uh, have a slightly better reach at, at low mass, whereas germanium has a slightly higher reach at above 10 GeV. In this talk, we're only considering sub 10 GeV results, so and, and I'm focusing on silicon results. Um, the super CDMS detectors uh, 
historically have read out both charge and phonons. And so the, the picture of a dark matter event is some scatter um, at the site shown in this crystal diagram at the right. Um, it produces it immediately produces phonons, lattice vibrations, as well as charges. And the charges are drifted in an electric field to be read out at the surface. Historically, we've used both phonon and charge sensors to read them out separately, and we apply a small field. But if you apply a large field, um, as shown by this equation here, um, you can actually get the total phonon energy just to be proportional to the number of electron hole pairs generated. And the first demonstration of this effect um, at the single electron level was done in 2017 um, by a group at Stanford. Um, and, and so the, the plot on the bottom right shows this effect where if I look at um, no events, I get a Gaussian around zero. If I look at uh, 30 photons, I get the distribution at around 50, 60 EV um, shown in the dashed line. And then as I increase the voltage, I start to see the single electron pair peak first at 50 volts and then at 150 volts. So we can use highly sensitive phonon detectors with resolutions below 10 EV. Um, both as phonon calorimeters for dark matter searches, as well as charge sensors for dark matter searches. Um, and so the super CDMS collaboration has evolved over the last few years as we prepare for the ultimate, um, the Snow Lab experiment um, into a bunch of different facilities. Um, and we've developed sort of a flow of new technology going from surface R&D facilities of which we have a few, um, Stanford, Northwestern, Berkeley, and Texas A&M are the, the sort of leading institutions on various efforts of R&D. And um, for dark matter results, really what's happened recently is we've got a bunch of results published from surface facilities. We've moved both of those detectors that I'm talking about today into the um, underground facilities. So Nexus has about 300 feet of over bird net Fermilab in a highly shielded low background fridge. And um, Qt is the same, actually, actually the same cryogenic system, but it's underground at Snow Lab near the future site of the snow box. Um, and so those are currently taking data, um, and I'll talk about prospects for that in a little bit. And then uh, installation is in progress for the snow box, which will host the, the full super CDMS snow lab experiment. So for electron recoil, that'll be the first topic. The flow has basically been through the surface facilities to Nexus. Um, Nexus is set up with high voltage readout. Um, that is needed for those detectors, as well as the, the fiber, um, laser fiber calibration system I'll be talking about. And the idea there is um, lessons learned will feed forward to the high voltage style detectors run at Snow Lab. And for the nuclear recoil side of the searches, um, again, um, initial designs are tested in the surface R&D facilities. Uh, they're going to Qute, which is better set up for the ultra low background and some of the longer time scale nu nuclear recoil calibrations. Um, we'll actually be running one of the super CDMS towers in Qt before going to the full snow box. Um, and so this is sort of the, the direction of the arrows is sort of um, increasing exposure and lowering of backgrounds. Um, and the goal of the first runs is always understanding detector performance and lowering the thresholds. So um, moving first to electron recoil searches, this is um, what we've been calling super CDMS HVEV, or the detectors running right now. These are gram scale and um, resolve single charges. The long-term uh, goal is to scale this up to the high voltage detectors at Snow Lab, which we've made we've made some prototypes of, but due to the high backgrounds at the surface, we have not yet been able to operate them at, at the same level of sensitivity. Um, and the main challenges here are charge leakage induced either by um, you know light backgrounds or high energy backgrounds understanding the quantized backgrounds we see, uh, and then maximizing charge collection efficiency and understanding you know, position dependence in our, in our, our backgrounds. So the first run, this was 2018. Um, you can see the scale of this experiment is much smaller <laughs> than any, most of the other experiments shown in this session. So it's a one gram crystal. This had a, a 10 EV resolution um, for the best run and was calibrated. You can see a fiber coming up at the back of this crystal. So the calibration was done by pulsing a a red 1.9 EV um, laser um, and observing quantized peaks from the laser. Um, and so this was the first device to demonstrate this effect and also um, the first device to set a limit. So the spectrum that we published in 2018 looks like this. Um, we could account for the first and second electron hole pair peaks just with detector physics, but we saw this somewhat non-quantized background extending out to 
uh, all the way up to about 10 electron hole pairs, at which point it starts to become consistent with the Compton background. So the, the non-quantized nature of this, you can see the laser is fairly quantized, that's the black, but the background being non-quantized is very confusing. Um, and so the goal coming out of this after setting the dark matter limits was to improve resolution and device um, understanding to quantize that background so we can start to actually model it. So the RUN2 setup, so this was um, taking the RUN1 detector, making some um, improvements to lower the threshold and then improving the enclosure. Um, and so the picture on the right shows, if you compare to this setup, this is fairly exposed to the fridge. Um, this is actually in a light tight box, which is mounted inside of this fridge. Um, we, uh, we, we ran otherwise the same program, um, doing calibrations with this laser fiber and um, exploring different voltage biases. Um, and the result is that we actually were able to quantize these backgrounds much more. Um, this is a this is a result that was put out um, in May and is undergoing final review in PRD. Um, the really surprising result here was that um, improving the resolution, we quantized the backgrounds and the rate of those quantized backgrounds was the same as run one. So let me highlight, these are different detectors made by different facilities with different crystals running at different sites with different backgrounds. So, um, the consistency between the run one and run two limits is it was actually pretty shocking. So we are we are convinced that at least above one, the one electron bin, these are real backgrounds um, and we're working on understanding them right now. So that that's uh, that was a spectrum for the run two. We set limits on um, electron recoil dark matter with uh, momentum dependent and independent form factors as well as dark photon absorption. Um, you can also see a fairly recent result here in the dark photon absorption and the ALP absorption from Super CDMS Sudan. This was a reanalysis of um, the, the full Sudan data set, um, and that does actually set the most competitive limits above um, for, uh, 40 EV or so. Um, and uh, we were the first collaboration to set these ALP limits, although um, that parameter space is largely excluded by astrophysical constraints, and um, you could expect the other dark photon limits to be cast into this space as well. So this is a recent result. Um, I, if you want more details, I want to point you, Valentina Novati gave this great uh, APS talk. This actually links to the video. So you can go there for more details, or you can uh, come ask me questions on Zoom. So switching over to the low mass nuclear recoil searches, um, this is sort of what I want to highlight in this talk because we actually have one result that hit the archive last night. That was not actually the plan. It was submitted a week and a half ago, but um, it just got held up until last night. So this is the first time this will be shown and I anticipate questions. So I want to leave a little bit of time at the end to talk about this. Um, for the nuclear recoil searches, we have sort of three technologies moving in parallel right now. The, Super CDMS CPD is a cryogenic photon detector designed for coherent neutrino scattering um, and um, readout of neutrinoless double beta decay. So that's the result I'll present now. There's going to be the HVV detector, which looks for ERDM, run at zero volts with the 3 EV resolution. So th those are results that will be coming out by the end of the year. And then we're starting to run some of the prototype Snow Lab detectors at CUTE, which is the Snow Lab underground facility. And the major challenges here are uh, maintaining these low thresholds and calibrating below 1 keV. So this, uh, this nuclear recoil detector, um, it's, a, it's bigger, it's about 10 grams. It's a three inch, uh, a standard three inch silicon wafer. Um, and it only has one readout channel. So um, the, the design driver here was large area, low resolution, and it also runs at a very low TC. So these are all cryogenic detectors. Um, and this detector in particular was the lowest um, sensor transition temperature we have run um, to date for super CDMS. Um, and as I said before, it's designed originally for degraded alpha rejection, but you know, uh, to do that, it needs exquisite um, energy resolution. And so um, we did a lot of characterization on this sensor. Um, we also, you know, we did this uh, iron 55 calibration, which I think is fairly standard now for these low mass searches. Um, where you get a 5.9 and 6.4 keV calibration line. You can also see a silicon escape peak around, um, I think, uh, 4.9 uh, 
kV. And then there's an aluminum fluorescence at one kV. And that's the primary, um, these are the four primary points used to linearize the energy scale. And um, what you notice immediately about this low energy region is while there's a flat background, which is what you'd expect from Compton's, especially due to the fact that the source can't be turned off in this, in this configuration, uh, it does rise at low energy. Um, and so we were able to achieve a threshold of 20 V for the search. We do cover new mass space. It's the first um, nuclear recoil search to pass below 100 MeV in dark matter mass. Um, and you can see though that um, the reach for that low threshold is, is pretty limited by this low energy rise. And so one of the, you know, immediately this is A, both interesting, you know, because it, it excludes new parameter space and B, um, you can see that it, it sort of starts to outline a, uh, a range of masses around 100 MeV where um, we're seeing in excess. And um, Yoni talked yesterday about other experiments, these, both these crest experiments that also see excesses of low energy. So this starts to add more data in a very significant way to this, um, this idea that uh, there is something new at low energy, whether it be a background or some interesting signal to probe. So uh, this also, um, this detector is now being run at Qt as well. So we're hoping to add data um, with the same detector in a lower background environment to better understand the source of this low energy excess. Okay, so future prospects. Uh, I've mentioned sort of as I'm going through this, how we move from the results we've put out over the last three months to um, more sensitive science, longer exposures running underground. Um, and so from the picture I showed at the beginning, there's sort of two paths we're going down now. Um, the electron recoil path is proceeding forward at Nexus, which is at Fermilab. This is right next to the Sensei um, setup as well. And so what we're working on right now is working with Sensei, who were able to reduce their backgrounds with extra shielding to um, better understand these low energy backgrounds in the electron recoil space and validate the, the, the observed behavior they saw, which is that as they add shielding, they start to see backgrounds going down. Um, if we can get our backgrounds under control, this is supposed to be a 100 DRU facility, so we should be able to probe well below thermal relic density at Nexus with uh, HVEV, um, assuming that the, the shielding works as designed and, and we're in the process of building the shielding now. Qt, which is at Snow Lab, this is also fully functioning. It's running, taking data now with PD2. Um, and uh, it, it has this giant water tank, it has a lot of lead. So this is designed to be a 10-ish, uh, sort of 10 DRU facility, um, also in the process of understanding backgrounds they see and, and working out um, some kinks in electronics, but um, we expect science results from that within the next year. And then um, there's more results from Sudan data coming out. It's gonna be uh, Mig Migdal slash Bremsstrahlung limits within the next month or two that the paper is just working its way through collaboration review. Um, there's a lip search pa paper also coming out very soon. And there's a bunch of solar neutrino science being led by um, um, our new analysis coordinator, Emmanuel Michelin at UBC and uh, David Sudeño at uh, Madrid. Um, so one of the most interesting things I wanna highlight and prime people to look out for by the end of the year is this follow-up of ERNR comparison. So I showed earlier a spectrum um, of the, the ER spectrum for HVV run two, where the background didn't change. And so the exposure for that run is shown on the top right. So the 100 volt limit is what I showed that had by far the most exposure, but we also took data at different voltages, especially at zero volts. So at zero volt, this is just a fall on calorimeter. And over the last six months or so, um, we've optimized the readout. What we actually did was record data continuously. And so we can go back and trigger and we've re-optimized the triggers so that we got a threshold of about 9.2 EV for us. So that's about a three sigma trigger for this detector. It's, it has a three EV resolution. Um, and so, you know, what we're in the process right now of modeling the noise contribution to the spectrum that passes through this trigger, because obviously, you know, a three sigma trigger is not going to be noise free, um, but it will have a, a threshold that's lower than PD2, a slightly improved resolution. We should be able to compare that and we should be able to compare the spectrum from this detector um, in the calorimeter mode with the electron recoil spectrum and figure out the source of those events, um, whether they're nuclear recoil or electron recoil and help better probe how, uh, how to reduce them or whether they're, they're starting to be some irreducible background. Um, 
There's also plans for a larger payload at Nexus where we're going to scale that up to 10 grams within the next month or two. Um, this is the just uh, a plug for Nexus. It's a, it's a multi-purpose uh, underground user facility for low temperature science. So this shows the current HVEV payload, which is working really well down there. It's the same detector that was run in run two. Um, there's this dilution fridge on a frame and the lead shield is under construction right now. So it sits on this platform and um, it's being stacked as I speak and, and we'll have the first data on uh, background reduction after shielding within the next couple of weeks. Um, this facility also does, if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about it, come talk to me. We're also wiring this up for um, MKID readout, SNSPDs and some qubit studies. So it should be a very interesting underground uh, facility for more general science. Uh, so finally, Super CDMS Snow Lab. Um, so this is the, the ultimate um, in low threshold detectors. The, we have silicon and germanium, which are um, 600 gram and 1.2 kilogram detectors, respectively. They have 12 channels, and they're expected to have resolutions on the order of 10 to 20 EV. Um, one big thing we're working on right now is that large channel count makes event reconstruction much more complicated. They're very fast signals. They're highly localized. Um, and so uh, there's a group that's leading um, some machine learning based reconstruction studies, which should both um, minimize resolution and help uh, extract a fairly accurate position for events the detector. Um, we also have two types of detector. One is these HV style and the other is the iZip, which is the older style of separate phone on and charge sensors. Um, the HV should get to lower threshold than the iZip. Uh, the iZip will be better for validating um, backgrounds in the cryostat. The facility will be underground at Snow Lab. I'm sure many of you in the dark matter community are very familiar with Snow Lab. Um, our part of the drift is shown on the bottom right here. So cute, which is what I've been talking about, that already exists. That's where it is in the drawing. And the snow box will be right next door. Um, the current status, I think this radon filter plant is now built and uh, in, in the process of being commissioned. And we are, um, we've taken delivery of the fridge. We're in the process of um, starting to uh, test and move things to, to Snow Lab over the next year or so. Um, as far as our long-term goals in the Super CDNS collaboration, but with Snow Lab, um, this is a sort of, this is a breakdown that was put together recently. Um, we already have limits from the R&D detectors and from Sudan that cover this whole space of, it's basically all of particle dark matter, including bosonic absorption down to one EV and then electron recoil in the sort of 500 keV to one GeV range, as well as traditional NR up to um, a TeV or so, although, you know, above 10 GeV, it's not going to be necessarily all that competitive with uh, the xenon experiments. But um, the projections that we've been showing for a while, um, we expect to have world leading sensitivity down um, to about 500 MeV with the nominal super CDMS snow lab payload. But the plan um, is sort of hybrid, you know, this will be the first run. And as we go forward, um, we will start to integrate more R&D detectors. So the high voltage um, detectors should drop in threshold um, and that will gain us a better background discrimination as well. Um, there's still R&D going on to the, the ionization readout. And then um, uh, there's a lot of R&D going on to, to severely dropping thresholds down to um, below 100 milli EV. And then small arrays of those detectors can cover a much lower mass space. So this is a cartoon, but it kind of shows you the, the various directions that we're going um, in and the picture we're gonna be pitching for super CDMS snow lab to the community as part of the snow lab, uh, the snow mass process. So summary, um, I talked about a lot of things. We're doing a lot of things. That's if you come away with one impression, there's a lot of us, we do a lot of things, do a lot of R&D and we now have a really nice pr process for taking the R&D and getting dark matter science out of it. Um, so we are seeing lots of backgrounds at low energy. Um, there's a lot of follow-up underway. Uh, I'm pointing, YoniCon gave a nice talk about phenomenologically interpreting some of these excesses yesterday. And Lauren Sue is giving the overview talk next week on uh, dark matter in general. And she'll talk a little bit about the status of these excesses in the dark matter community. Um, look out for a bunch of new results, especially this nine EV threshold result in the next six months. Um, the, the snow lab detectors will substantially improve exposure and, 
And they're going to benefit especially from what we learn about these new low energy backgrounds and about charge leakage. Um, and then also, you know, I didn't discuss in a ton of detail, but we have a lot of calibration programs underway to understand nuclear recoils. Um, so the, the charge yield below a KEV, especially down to 100 EV and less. Um, and the first of those results should also be coming out by the end of the year. This was a uh, running the HVV detector in the tunnel neutron beam. Um, yeah, so that, that's all I have. I'll take, I, I know I went a little past the 20 minutes that I had for talking, but there's a couple minutes for questions, I think. Thank you very much, Noah. Yes, there are a few minutes for oh. questions. Bjorn? Bjorn, if you can unmute you, you will be. Sorry, I'm always double muted. Um, so, um, Noah, hi, this is Bjorn. Um, in this low energy nuclear recoil uh, regime, how do you calibrate this and how well do you understand charge propagation there? So um, you're talking about this, this new result here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this actually has nothing to do with charge. This is just a pure phonon readout. Um, okay. So the charge is, the bias is zero volt and the charge just recombines almost immediately. So um, we're just getting, you know, the tens of thousands of phonons collected in the phonon sensors. The calibration, um, like I said, we have these five lines. We have other ways to quantify the nonlinearity and the energy scale of the detector. So um, there's a lot of validation plots that we did. There's a there's one in the paper showing that there is nonlinearity and we've linearized this as much as possible. Part of the reason for the follow-up with the HV EV detectors is we can actually calibrate the energy scale with the laser. So we can get arbitrary data points below one KEV. And um, that's gonna be the main cross check on whether there's any residual nonlinearity in the spectrum below a KEV. So we, um, we are fairly confident that this has been properly linearized, but you know, um, just like most of the other um, low nuclear recoil searches, we have this uncertainty of not really having a ton of calibration below one KEV. And so, we're working on strategies to bootstrap that. Okay, thank you. Chelsea, if you want to go next. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Could you go back to, I think it was slide 16. I mean, yes, this please. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned Poisson counting method um, is less system, uh, sensitive to systematic uncertainties. Um, why is that? I'm just curious. <laughs> Um, so this is sort of uh, to explain why the run two result here is slightly worse than the run one, but the spectrum is the same. Um, so what, what we're saying here is that uh, essentially we've smeared in the run one, the background is smeared enough um, that you can, you have a broad Gaussian, you can kind of find with the optimal interval method bins where the, the natural fluctuation gives you a slightly better sensitivity. Um, because we're so quantized here, you can see the dark matter model for the run two spectrum has these sharp peaks. And so you can't really play games with the events in between peaks in the same way you can with a lower resolution detector. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's basically the resolution is good enough that we can literally just say, we expect the signal to be quantized. We look within three sigma of a peak and we just do a counting experiment. I see, okay, thank you. So if no other question, I would like to thanks now for the nice talk again, and we can move ahead with the next speaker. Okay, that's my zoom info, by the way, it's in the slides. Thank you. Now. Thank you. So we have Simon Beal as the next speaker. Thank the you. Dark matter results from the snow lab. And uh, you can share your slides as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. So yes, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the latest results from Deep3600 at Snow Lab. Deep Collaboration has 95 researchers from nine countries. And so we're still growing as a collaboration. About half the collaboration is from Canada and uh, the other institutes are listed here. What we're looking for is this kind of signal. Obviously uh, the sun, as it goes around the galactic center with the earth and tow, uh, sees a headwind uh, of uh, wind particles. And so we're hoping um, 
to detect these, uh, these dark matter particles in our underground detectors on Earth. And we go underground because uh, we want to shield our detector from cosmic rays. And so there's this eight order magnitude um, decrease from uh, surface counts in terms of uh, neon flux uh, to going to Snow Lab, which is one of the deepest laboratories uh, in the world. And so DEEP is located in Cube Hall, which is uh, here on this map of Snow Lab, uh, located right here. And so you can see the snow detector, which is now you know, upgraded Snow Plus. Um, uh, this is uh, going to be deep right here. And uh, if you haven't seen uh, Snow Lab, if you haven't visited, there's a virtual visit on the outreach website that I highly recommend. And so it's on this link here. And so I'm gonna show a few pictures of deep uh, during construction. So you have a clear view of uh, the detector. Um, deep is the uh, largest acrylic cryostat ever built. Here you can see the installation of the neck of the detector. This is going to be important later. Uh, and on each of these uh, spots here, 255 of them, there are light guides. So this is shown with the light guides installed um, at, in, in figure A here. And then reflectors were installed on each light guide. And then PMTs were bonded looking inward in he each of the 255 channels here. And after backing foam insulation and steel shell installation, and also um, beyond veto PMTs looking outward, the detector looked like this. And then we filled the water Cherenkov veto. You can see here uh, on the left. So this is about a 10 meter veto uh, that you can see here. All the details are available in our uh, detector publication here. It was published in Astroparticle Physics. DEEP stands for Dark Matter Experiment Using uh, Argon Pulse Shape Discrimination with a de design mass of 3,600 uh, kilograms of liquid argon, hence the name. Uh, and the goal is really to detect dark matter particles uh, colliding with argon nuclei. And so these dark matter particles come through the snow lab over Berlin into uh, the liquid argon the detector, inducing nuclear recoils. Um, and, then, uh, and then if they do, if, if dark matter exists and it's detectable, uh, this, these nuclear recoils would show up in, uh, in excitations of the argon uh, into the dimer excited state. And this dimer excited argon 2 de excites, um, leaving a 128 nanometer photon. This is too uh, high energy for our um, um, PMTs to uh, detect too low wavelength. And so we shift the wavelength using a layer of TPB right on the inside surface of the acrylic vessel. And uh, what we actually detect are the 420 nanometer photons going up the light guides into the PMTs. And so there are two deep 3600 data sets. Uh, the first field data set that was collected in August, 2016, and the, uh, the dark matter results were published in PRL. And um, the second fill is, uh, is actually has just ended in March 28th, um, 2020. So what I'm gonna be showing is the uh, results of the first year analysis. So November, 2016 to October, 2017. Uh, using this much liquid argon, and uh, that was published in the Physics Review D. I'm also going to show new um, interpretations in terms of uh, non relativistic uh, effective field theories uh, that are being shown here for the first time. And so this is uh, the lifetime of the detector uh, over this whole second field campaign. As you can see, our um, dead time is very low, shown here in white, around 3%. Uh, and then our radioactive source campaigns are shown here in pink. We're still taking data. Uh, so we've now emptied the detector to reach a safe state uh, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, but we're still taking data in uh, gas argon and vacuum. And this informs our background model uh, for the full, uh, full data set analysis. We have a very good model of liquid argon uh, scintillation and, uh, and TPB emission and also PMT after pulsing effects. Um, Basically, uh, when, when liquid argon de-excites, uh, there's this, uh, this singlet lifetime, which is very prompt, and the triplet lifetime, which is at a much longer time scale. And uh, this is critical in the terms of um, distinguishing nuclear recoils from electron recoils. The full pulse rate model has been published uh, this year. You can look here for more details. And the key point here is that uh, Electron recoils or uh, beta decays emit more late light uh, compared to the prompt light in this, in this window. 
compared to signal-like nuclear recoils that you can see here, where there's a higher ratio of prompt light to total light in the event. And so F prompt is the variable that we use here, um, which is the prompt fraction of the light. And you can see it in the 1D histogram here. And so in this neutron source calibration data, you can see uh, how uh, we neutron nuclear recoils created this uh, pink line here, uh, including the, the gamma emissions, um, that is well modeled with data, whereas uh, argon-39 nuclear, uh, sorry, argon-39 beta emissions created this shape here. And so we have a very good parameterization and understanding of pulse shape discrimination in our detector and uh, taking a, a cumulative distribution function of, uh, from this data set without calibration source, we get this plot, uh, which is the CDF of F prompt for a sliding cut and uh, demonstrating a world-leading uh, PSD performance of 10 to the minus nine for 50% uh, percent nuclear recall acceptance. More details in our uh, paper here. And so looking at the uh, events that we do detect, uh, you know, so F prompt here is shown here on the y-axis compared to the number of photoelectrons detected. And so in what we call the uh, electronic recoil band, you can see this argon-39 again here, at higher energy, these uh, are gamma uh, decays uh, causing these events. Um, in the nuclear recoil band, we see full energy alpha decays, uh, but then some alphas are attenuated. Some neutron scatters can create a lower energy event. These are mainly the uh, backgrounds we um, need to quantify the most because the dark matter region of interest is right here at low energy, high F prompt. And so focusing on the uh, electromagnetic background uh, band, so the lower band here at first, uh, you can see here a very good model for these backgrounds, uh, the argon-39 uh, spectrum is shown here. And then we have the potassium-40, uh, thallium-208 peaks. This shoulder here is dominated by argon-42, uh, potassium-42 uh, decays. And so uh, this provided uh, the, uh, uh, the world-leading measurement of the, uh, this, the activity for these decays in, in atmospheric argon. In terms of the uh, nuclear recoils, um, neutrons can uh, that predominantly come from alpha N reactions in the PMTs, uh, can uh, scatter around. Some of them, um, so most of them will be absorbed in the foam and the acrylic, but some of them can reach the uh, liquid argon where they cause nuclear recoils before they capture either on hydrogen or argon 40. When they do capture uh, and we see the gamma, we can reject the event. Uh, otherwise, we uh, this allows for uh, defining a, a um, control region where we can have data-driven estimate of, of neutron backgrounds. And this uh, estimate is in agreement with our bottoms-up estimate, uh, taking material assays, or PMTs, for example, as input. In terms of alpha backgrounds, um, the, the takeaway here is that we have a very good model. Our model describes uh, very well the data that you can see here in the black crosses. Uh, and so the different components for the model are shown here in color. Uh, this is for, uh, for uh, alpha decays in the bulk of the detector. And so because the, all the energy here is, de is deposited in liquid argon, these uh, are much higher energy than potential dark matter interactions. And so this has no impact on the dark matter search. In terms of surface alpha backgrounds, uh, there is this tail here going to uh, lower photoelectrons detected. This is because a lot of the energy can be deposited in the acrylic or the TPB uh, before being detected. Uh, and potentially this leaks into the dark matter region of interest. But fortunately, these events reconstruct right at the surface of the detector. And so this requires very good position reconstruction, which is the topic of this slide. And so in deep, we have two main algorithms that are complementary. There's one that's PE based uh, in that more uh, photoelectrons are detected closer to the uh, to the event. If you can imagine the surface event, most of the photons will go towards the nearest PMT. And so uh, using the full 10 microsecond event window, we can <clears throat> have a very good uh, reconstruction based on just on, on the pattern of, uh, of detected signals in the PMTs. The other one is uh, time residual based. Uh, and so based on the uh, time of flight uh, in uh, of the photons, um, uh, photoelectrons will be detected closer, earlier, closer to the event. And so using the first 40 nanosecond uh, of the event, um, we can uh, use a likelihood fit to the time of arrival uh, distribution detected in the event to, to get a, a reconstructed position. 
And so both of these algorithms uh, are uh, reconstructing uh, the events very well. The, for illustration, this is the uh, reconstructed radius. Uh, it's come as a function of uh, reconstructed radius and uh, the contained liquid argon mass based on our observation of uh, argon 39 events. And so you can see there's very good agreement between the results from our fitters versus uh, the analytical calculation for the contained liquid argon mass for a, at a given radius. Our fiducial radius here is uh, 630 millimeters um, in reconstructed R. And, and this is far enough from the surface, which is at 350, uh, given our resolution of uh, 30 to 45 millimeters of the fiducial uh, volume boundary. This is very uh, uh, far from the actual surface. And so uh, the leakage of surface alphas is very small, as shown here. Neck alpha backgrounds, on the other hand, are a more challenging, unexpected background, uh, unexpected during the design of the detector uh, that ends up uh, being very significant in, in D. And so what's happening here is that um, in these flow guides, uh, the liquid argon that's uh, being cooled down uh, drips from the, in the inner side here. And then uh, there's gas argon from evaporation that comes out here in the outer Part of the flow guide. This leads to condensation on these cold surfaces. And so when there's a polonium 210 decay on one of these surfaces, uh, sometimes for some topologies, the uh, light will be uh, shadowed just enough to show up in the low energy, high F prompt uh, WIMP region of interest. And so this is very signal-like and results in a particularly challenging source of background events. But by now we have a good simulation, a good model of what's going on. And this is shown on this slide where you can see these. Um, so what's shown here is a reconstructed Z vertical position in the detector versus photoelectrons uh, detected. And the smoking gun is really these arms feature here that are seen in the data. And so on the left, this is a simulation from a model. On the right, this is data. And you can clearly see the same features here. And so this allows for a template fit using uh, multiple control regions defined here in blue and um, constraining separately the contribution from the outer flow guide and the inner flow guide surfaces uh, as shown here in this fit. There's also an extra source of background that we're actively uh, investigating. Uh, by now we know uh, what it is and it'll be, it'll feature in our next dark matter uh, publication. But this is shown here in, in red and we have a better model than flat now, but this is uh, what has been published so far. So uh, for rejecting these neck alpha backgrounds, we developed a dedicated event selection. Um, one uh, feature that helps a lot is that we have neck veto uh, wavelength shifting fibers here in, uh, on top of the detector. And so in events that come from the neck uh, tend to lead to excess lights. And so we apply in what we call the neck veto based on light in uh, these fibers that are detected with four dedicated PMTs in the neck. When uh, there's a neck event, there's also excess light in the top rows of the PMTs here due to reflection on the liquid argon surface. This also results in early light in the top rows of PMT. So we have cuts uh, to reject those events. And also crucially, um, our two position reconstruction algorithms disagree uh, when a, it's a, an actual neck event versus uh, when it's a, a true uh, scintillation event from the liquid argon bulk shown here is a delta Z between the time-based and PE-based reconstruction um, uh, algorithms for uh, a WIMP simulation shown in green, uh, argon 39 data shown in blue. So you can see there's very good agreement between our fitters here, but then for neck events, uh, this disagrees. And so this allows us to place a cut on this quantity. And so overall, uh, there's one last handle, which is pulse shape discrimination. These um, neck alpha, uh, our events are at truly higher energy. Uh, it's just that the light is shadowed. So this results in slightly higher f prompt, which is shown here in the red band, compared to actual low energy recoils, which are slightly lower. So this is the green band that is shown here, again, in f prompt versus PE. And then uh, because of false discrimination, the uh, uh, argon 39 uh, backgrounds are, are much lower in f prompt. And so this is our region of interest shown here in black. And uh, this is our acceptance and our background budget for the 231 live day analysis is shown here, which is, uh, as you can see, dominated by these NEC alpha events. And so the, the critical moment was 
um, was dark matter observed in the first year of data taking? Um, nope, we saw no event in the fiducial volume here. Uh, as expected, there are some surface events here shown in, in green, and there are some events that we're constructing at lower radius. These can be um, neutrons or a surface misconstruction that are closer to the, to the surface here. Uh, but uh, there's, there's no event observed here in the um, signal region, whereas we have significant WIMP acceptance. And so this is what we published last year and resulted in this limit shown here in red. Um, where it gets more interesting is our uh, recent um, revaluation of these limits for other sets of hypotheses beyond the benchmark. And so what's shown here, and it's uh, shown uh, at this conference for the first time, is variations in the speed distributions for uh, dark uh, matter uh, compared to the standard halo model, the standard halo model. Um, and so the black line that you can see in each of these plots is the same. It's the distribution that's expected from the standard halo model, which is the benchmark they use used in, in most publications. But then the variations from the SHM uh, according to different uh, possible structures in the galactic uh, dark matter halo uh, are shown here. And so, for example, in what's called Gaia Enceladus or the Gaia sausage, uh, if we vary the dark matter content to uh, being, let's say, up to 70% in this uh, structure, that's the difference in the uh, speed profile that we would get uh, here. And similarly for uh, other possible um, substructures in, in, in the dark matter halo in the galaxy. And so based on, on these variations, uh, we can recast our null result. Uh, the standard uh, halo model is shown here in black, but then the other ones based on different substructures uh, are shown here in, in color uh, for different groups and also for Gaia and Celadus. Um, it's also noteworthy that for uh, isospin violating dark matter couplings, and so without uh, assuming uh, the same coupling to protons versus neutrons, uh, DEEP is actually word leading for a region of the parameter space. And then we also investigated in a more general non-relativistic effective field theory framework, where uh, instead of taking just the um, operator uh, O1 that is typically used in the benchmark, we considered other effective field theory operators here, O11, O3, O8, O5. And uh, here you can see the same limits uh, on the uh, spin independent uh, dark matter uh, cross-section as a function of dark matter mass. Um, and what's the, the colored band here is the variation for more dark matter, let's say in the S1 uh, dark matter halo substructure. Uh, this is for a retrograde uh, stellar steam, uh, stream S1, uh, where you can see the uh, delta sigma in the limit versus sigma in the standard halo model. So you see these variations here uh, for, a, um, uh, for a prograde uh, stellar stream the, uh, it, it goes in the other direction. And so what I've shown you so far is our published dark matter search from our first year data set, November 2016 to uh, October 2017. But we have now a lot more data uh, collected, 80% uh, blind since uh, January 1st, 2018. And so now to improve the sensitivity using uh, this, this uh, data set, we have developed three multivariate analysis algorithms specifically targeted against neck alpha events. So what you should, what's shown here is the neural network score for new, uh, nuclear recoil shown in blue versus uh, neck alpha events shown here in orange. And so there's very good performance. And then uh, this is also uh, being validated in data. Uh, and here's shown good agreement in the score between uh, our, our Argonaut 39 event simulation versus read events. And so uh, now we're validating all three of these algorithms and looking at all correlations between input and output variables to make sure we can use them in the dark matter search. And uh, we're going to re-optimize our dark matter candidate defense selection to be especially sensitive uh, in our uh, three-year data analysis. The main um, uh, upgrades that are coming forward and uh, now that we've emptied the detector is that we have an ambitious hardware upgrade program. So our, the main objective is to limit uh, and mitigate these uh, background sources in the experiment. And so we're replacing the neck uh, we're also going to um, cover the new neck with a slow wavelength shifter to remove the neck backgrounds with PSD and uh, keeping the neck warm with an alternate cooling system. And so this should be the end. We should have a neck background free exposure starting in 2021. 
And we're also dealing with this uh, other source of background that I alluded to. And so the current status is that these repairs are going to take place uh, in the coming six months. And we expect new dark matter search data in this upgraded detector uh, starting in 2021. And so this is uh, this sensitivity here would be even improved compared to uh, our current data. And uh, this will also inform the design of next generation liquid argon dark matter experiments. Uh, I'm out of time here. I just want to advertise the global argon dark matter collaboration. Um, Dark side and, and deep and mean clean and RDM collaborations have joined forces towards dark side 20K, as was explained in uh, Luigi's talk yesterday. And so the dark side 20K technical design report is in preparation. Um, but this experiment is, is uh, projected to be extremely sensitive to um, um, spin independent uh, dark matter uh, interactions with nuclear recoils. And we're also working in earnest towards Argo the multi hundred ton liquid argon detector to reach the um, neutrino floor. And so in conclusion, we're looking for dark matter with deep 3600. We have an excellent detector performance and we're going to analyze our full three year data set using a multi analysis. There's a lot of new searches and uh, measurements that I haven't uh, talked about. There's a search for multiply interacting massive particles. Um, there's analysis of the muon flux at Snow Lab there are argon 39 uh, specific activity and uh, half-life measurements coming up and a search for uh, solar axions, uh, just to mention a few. And so we have a, a, an ambitious physics program with our rich data set and are going to perform a hardware upgrade to be even more sensitive to dark matter going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting talk. And there's uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, not seeing any, so maybe I will ask one. So I'm wondering about the, your uh, collaboration, the Argon collaboration and the, yeah. where that is going. So what kind of lab support, if you're looking for any lab support, are you planning to, to be based a specific lab for the tests or? Do you mean for yeah. R&D or for the experiment? The experiment Darkside 20K will be at uh, NGS and then we're uh, planning on Argo at Snow Lab. Okay, so, and then the other question is that you're, because it's a sort of multi-lab collaboration, you're doing the R&D separately or together? Yeah, no, separately. So there's a lot of R&D still uh, going on and, and finalizing the design of Darkside 20K. We're in better shape now than uh, ever, um, but there's still uh, R&D that was mentioned in, in uh, Luigi's talk uh, going to uh, for the um, uh, for the SIPM that's almost done now, uh, but also for coatings, uh, for uh, TPB deposition, for the acrylic vessel that needs to be built. Uh, so we know a lot of that, uh, how to do that from the previous experiments, but going at such scale, there's uh, in the in the different universities and uh, and national labs, there's a lot of uh, effort going on to meet uh, our, our schedule for Darkside 20K. And then for Argo, there are even uh, bigger questions. So uh, for example, is it going to be a single phase uh, detector or is it going to be a um, dual phase TPC? And so these uh, are design studies that are also taking place. And the Darkside LM, how is it connected to this effort? Yeah, so Darkside Low Mass is a dedicated it's detector uh, looking to um, exploit the effects that Paolo just mentioned in, in previously in the session. Uh, and so with a bigger mass, uh, we're planning to reach a very good sensitivity uh, at low mass. And it's still part of a, anyway, the same collaboration somehow. It's the same collaboration, different detector, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, if no other question, maybe we can move ahead with uh, the next speaker of the session. So Sergio Palomares Ruiz, if you want to start sharing the slide. And he will talk about probing heavy dark matter with the six year ice cube uh, hazy data. Okay, so we can see you, but not the slide yet. Okay, great. Now, yes, thanks. Now you see the full screen, right? 
Yes. Okay. Okay. So okay. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm going to to uh, uh, well, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. And good morning uh, to everyone. And I'm I'm well being the last talk of uh, of the of the session. I'm probably I think I was of the day. I'm going to completely change gears. I feel a bit of an outsider in this session, but I'm going to completely change gears. So we've we've heard during the this afternoon. Well, this afternoon for me. Um, uh, many talks on uh, direct uh, searches of dark matter in the GV regime, and I'm going to to talk about dark detection of dark matter with uh, very heavy dark matter with masses in the range between 100 TeV to a few PeV, and I will not be talking about the detection of dark matter, direct detection of dark matter, but of indirect detection and in particular of indirect detection with neutrinos and with uh, with the Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope, and in particular. With the HESI, uh, with HESI data that we'll explain next. So I will say a few words about uh, ice cube detector and the uh, astrophysical and uh, neutrino flags of search by ice cube and how we can use it to search for new physics and, um, and in particular to, to search for dark matter. Okay, so okay, so uh, the ice cube neutrino detector probably uh, you know and I'm sure you know and I don't even have a slide for that but it's a gigantic uh, uh, detector placed at the South Pole is one kilometer cube of instrumented material in the ice. And the detection principle is the detection of the Cherenkov light emitted by the charged particles, which are produced by, by particles in neutrino interactions, either inside the detector or outside the detector. And this is why we have like two grand classes of, 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 uh, of events. Uh, then there are subcategories, but these are the two uh, types of uh, searches. So one is using contain events, in which case uh, the, the, the interaction vertex of the neutrino happens inside the detector. And this is uh, the type of events that I will be discussing in this talk. HESI events stands for high energy starting events. And this is a sample of events that, uh, we, that have the vertex inside the detector. And then we have through and muon events, which are produced by muon neutrinos that go through the, the, through the Earth and produce a, a, a muon, a muon a lepton outside the detector, and this muon goes through the detector, and this is why they are called through muon muons. And um, one can do a, 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 a fit of the of the of the data, uh, trying to fit the the astrophysical neutrino flux, which is way over the atmospheric uh, background and many sigma already, uh, with the number of uh, with the number of years that uh, Ice Cube has been collected data. This is said that many sigma. So one can do a fit of the observed uh, astrophysical spectrum with a simple and featureless power law uh, flux. That is what one would expect naively and roughly uh, from uh, astrophysical accelerators. And it turns out that if one does uh, this kind of fit, for instance, with the contained sample, like HESI sample, one gets something like this uh, uh, orange contours, which is, this is the normalization of the spectrum, and this is the spectral index. So basically one, is, one gets uh, an index, which is very, very large, very soft spectrum, an index very close to three, that, which is much softer than what uh, one would expect naively from an astrophysical uh, accelerator. What happens is one, if one does uh, the, the fit uh, with the through in sample, then one gets this blue contour, and that means that, uh, and that uh, it represents a much harder spectrum, much in agreement with uh, the expectations, the theoretical expectations, something like an uh, spectral index of 2.2, 2.3, something like that. So this tension between these uh, two samples, and here these are another result from a different sample, um, are in tension at uh, more than two sigma, I would say close to three sigma. Uh, so this might be more than a tension on the data or samples or anything, it's really maybe a tension on, on the input that we are using. So maybe the simple power law featureless uh, spectrum is not the end of the story and the spectrum it has more structure and maybe we need uh, more components. And actually uh, the, the rest of the talk will be more along those lines to having uh, what, is, uh, what is the implication of having more components and if we can fit the data better than with a single component. So how can we use this data, uh, all these neutrinos uh, uh, observed by Ice Cube to search for new physics? Basically it's using Different, the different observables in Ice Cube. One can use uh, uh, the energy, which is measured uh, in Ice Cube of these events. One can use also the, the arrival direction, so the angular spectrum of the, of the neutrino flux that, uh, that uh, reaches Ice Cube. And one can also use the flavor composition of this flux, uh, which is a unique, uh, uh, let's say, 
observable uh, with neutrino uh, detectors. And then one can also use uh, the arrival time of, uh, of these neutrinos when compared with other messengers. Uh, here I have many different scenarios that uh, are affected by or affect uh, different observables. But in the case of, I will be concentrated on dark matter decays and I will make some comments on annihilations. The observables that are mostly affected are the energy spectrum and the angular spectrum. Uh, a little bit on flavor, but not, not really important. These are the two main energy and angular uh, direction is the most, uh, the most, the, the most important uh, observables. So let me talk about dark matter decays next. So I, actually, just soon after the, the first uh, two PEB uh, uh, neutrinos uh, in ice cube were, were observed, there was this paper by Felsen and collaborators where they posed the following question. Can the, this highest energy PEB neutrinos be explained by heavy dark matter decays? And actually, one can do a simple back of the envelope uh, calculation and realize that uh, to explain PV events, one needs uh, PV dark, dark matter. So for this mass, one would need a lifetime of the order of 10 to 28 seconds or so, which is kind of reasonable or can be achieved uh, from theoretical models. And soon after this paper, there was a, another paper by Smiley and Serpico, where actually they were not trying to explain only the highest energy events, so these two PEV events, but they were, they were considering the possibility to explain all the ice cube neutrinos on top of the atmospheric uh, background to be explained by heavy dark matter decays. They used two years of uh, HESI data and they consider different combinations of soft and hard channels and managed to get a reasonable fit of the astrophysical uh, neutrino flux in terms of dark matter decays. Actually, this qualitatively has, has not changed uh, much uh, along the years, as I will explain in this talk. Okay, so this was uh, the thing. And uh, so what are the, but actually what are the, 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 the neutrinos from dark matter decay coming from? So we have two components. We have one galactic component, which depends uh, on the density of the dark matter. So it's more concentrated towards the galactic center. And then we have an extragalactic component, which is isotropic. So this, uh, the, the, the sum of these two components, of these uh, two contributions, produces a, an, an angular anisotropy on the signal, unlike what happens with the expected as, uh, isotropic astrophysical uh, signal. And here, in these two uh, figures, I'm showing you just uh, different uh, neutrino flux as expected for different decay channels. So for instance, on the right, I'm showing you uh, the decay, dark matter decays in, into leptons, and that produces very hard channels. And like what happens if dark matter decays into, into quarks, in which case the neutrino spectrum is much softer, picking at lower energies. And this is just something uh, to keep in mind for the rest of the talk. Quark, uh, decays into quark channels produce soft channels, soft, neut soft neutrino spectrum, and decays into leptons produce uh, uh, a hard neutrino spectrum. Okay, so after these uh, few early papers on proposing the, the possibility that part of all of the dark of the neutrino spectrum observed by, by Ascube uh, could be as, explained in terms of dark matter decays, there were a number of papers investigating the possibility that the, if the angular spectrum was compatible with what it was seen, as I just mentioned, the uh, dark matter decays would have uh, some angular anisotropy towards the uh, I mean, more enhanced towards the galactic center. And there were a number of papers saying that, yeah, asking this question, like, are neutrinos from dark matter decays compatible with the angular distribution of the ice cube events? And depending, there were different analyses, as I said, using different samples, uh, different assumptions. So they got a slightly different uh, uh, conclusions, but uh, they were not significantly different. Basically, all the conclusions are similar within, say, one, one and a half sigma. So we cannot really tell uh, if uh, which one of the two options is, is better just with the current statistics and using uh, these two uh, hypotheses. Okay, so, but uh, so far I've only considered the possibility that uh, these this, uh, events could be explained by, by only dark matter decays like in the Smiley and Serpico paper. But uh, if we only explain part of the spectrum, we need to explain the rest and the rest would be explained uh, with astrophysical uh, neutrino flux, the, the usual expected astrophysical neutrino flux. As, fa as far as I know, the first analysis that included dark matter decays and an astrophysical neutrino flux trying to fit the HESI data was this paper by Atriba Tacharya, Holsi Green, and Ina Sarcevic, where they fixed the astrophysical index to two. Then there, there have been other limit, other analysis doing limits on monochromatic decays. By no means, this, 
this list of, uh, of papers that I mentioned here is exhaustive. Uh, these are just a, a selection of some of the early papers on this. There have been all, all other analyses of other samples, like for instance, the Messi sample. This is uh, similar to the HESI sample. HESI sample starts at 10 TeV and goes uh, beyond the, the PeV range. And the Messi sample goes down to one TeV. In this analysis, they offer fixed the astro index, but they also consider astrophysical flags. One can also do a six year, uh, the six year analysis of HESI, which is what I will present. In this analysis, it was done fixing the astro, astrophysical index, which I will, uh, leave, uh, will leave free in, in all our, the, the analysis I will present. And then also one can in principle use the seven and a half years of HESI, which uh, have not been fully released uh, publicly. And this was done uh, in a paper after the paper I will be presenting today um, by this group. And they also added some priors on the through OME sample. The results are, are, are very similar actually with uh, what, what did you get with uh, six years. But let me move on. And, um, but apart from the neutrino spectrum, when dark, if dark matter decays, would also be accompanied by a gamma ray spectrum. And um, however, gamma rays with energies about say 10, 100 TeV, uh, for, for those energies, the universe is not transparent anymore and actually gamma rays interact with the background radiation, mainly the CMB and produce uh, E plus and minus pairs, which produce for the gamma rays uh, B inverse Compton and the CMB photons. And then until energies of these gamma rays fall below say 100 GeV or so for which this cascade process uh, cannot proceed any, for, any further because we don't produce uh, these in plus and minus pairs. So, and then one can test if the neutrino flux and the expected flux of gamma rays at high energies are associated with these neutrino flux, what is the uh, gamma ray flux below 100 GeV that would be expected from this cascade process? And one can search for that in experiments like Fermilab. One has to be, one has to take into account that the uh, this applies, uh, what I just said, applies to extra galactic signal. Uh, but in the case of the galactic signals, the, uh, there is different absorption. Actually, full absorption is not guaranteed. And actually, one could expect uh, uh, to see uh, gamma rays in the TV range uh, uh, of, uh, from dark matter decays in the galaxy. And this seems to be OK with current detectors. But if one does, for instance, uh, analysis of, for instance, uh, the dark matter decays into, into BB bar, taking all this into account, it seems uh, there is tension. This is what one would expect uh, uh, from ice cube data and the red lines are uh, the limits from gamma ray. Anything below is below the lines are, are excluded. So it seems that for some channels, there is tension between gamma rays and neutrino uh, uh, data, if one wants to inter interpret the data in terms of a dark matter decays. And for the rest of the talk, whenever I, whenever I talk about gamma ray limits, I will be using the, those from this paper. Although let me, uh, let me point out these other papers and in particular this last paper, I see what at all, which uh, update, uh, uh, updates uh, the limits from this paper and extend uh, with further messages. And let me just comment on another paper, which uh, was uh, suggested the possibility that there was a high galactic uh, latitude uh, TV uh, signal in gamma rays um, that could be the the counterpart of a, a neutrino extender source from the galaxy, from the galaxy, and that could be, for instance, a, a, dark, a, a signal from dark matter decay uh, from the galactic halo. But I, I won't say any further on that. So let me move on to the analysis. And before getting to the six-year analysis, which is what I will be presenting, uh, let me show you what is the results from the four-year analysis, for which we also wrote a paper, and see how the, the results evolve in time. So for instance, in the case of dark matter decays into quarks, you see that we, we need short life science to explain part of the spectrum. And let me just stress, I didn't say this, and in all this analysis, I will assume, I will take a, a possible dark matter decay contribution and an astrophysical power law flux uh, contribution. So we, I'm fitting, we are fitting all, all, both uh, contributions with all the parameters involved. So in the case of dark matter decays into quark channels, you see a soft spectrum explaining the 100 TeV. This is the black, uh, the black line is uh, the, expected, uh, the best fit for dark matter decays. And uh, the, red, the green line is the astrophysical flux and the total one is the magenta one. So uh, you see that for dark matter decays into quarks, uh, we explain the soft, the short, uh, low energy data around 100 TeV or so. But the problem is that we need short lifetimes and uh, that produces too much uh, gamma rays, as I will, I will show next. And uh, the good thing is that this explaining the low energy events in terms uh, uh, with dark matter decays, that uh, leaves the high energy events to be explained by 
the astrophysical spectrum. So that requires the astrophysical spectrum to have a, a power law of index of the order of 2, 2.2, something like that, which is fully compatible with theoretical expectations and what it is seen by uh, the through wave mu sample. Then if we go to harder channels, like uh, annihilation uh, the case into, into gauge bosons, uh, then we get longer lifetimes, that is good. And, uh, and then uh, these uh, decays uh, are meant to explain the, high ener the highest energy part. So that leaves the, the low energy part uh, around 100 TeV to be explained by the astrophysical spectrum, which requires a very soft with, uh, with an index uh, much larger than three, something like 3.5 or so in the, for the best fit scenario. And uh, just let me stress about this about this panel here on top of, on top right. Here is the, the allowed regions for the case of decays into uh, W bosons. This is the lifetime versus the mass. And you see that the best fit lies uh, within the PV range. But you see these one sigma regions in, around the 100 TV regime. And this uh, just to just uh, I want you to keep this in mind because this will become relevant when we add this, this, the uh, two more years of data. Here I show you uh, the analysis, uh, the results for, for harder channels, uh, the case into leptons. And you see here, we get very long lifetimes with masses in the PV regime. So that explains the high energy part of the spectrum in terms of dark matter decays. And the low energy part is explained by a very soft astrophysical spectrum. And that happens for all these hard channels. Here I'm just showing you just for reference, uh, the different uh, channels that we consider of uh, dark matter decays. Here I show you the best fit uh, results and the, the typical values of the astrophysical indices. Typically for soft channels, we get uh, astrophysical index more in agreement with, uh, with the through immune sample. When we go to harder channel, that uh, we need the, the astrophysical spectrum to explain the, the 100 TB regime in the uh, ice cube data sample. So that requires a very soft astrophysical sample, astrophysical uh, index. Uh, but overall, you see that the delta k square for all the channels with different energy regimes, that energy samples that we consider are within a few units. So all, all these cases give a reasonable fit only using neutrino data. So one can also set limits on this. And uh, here I show you different limits. This is limits dark matter uh, decaying to BB bar. This is Ws, and these are the, the, the lower panels are in, in, into leptons. And the, dot, the dotted lines are gamma ray limits, and every, 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 anything below these lines is excluded. So you see that uh, the gamma ray limits in the case of dark matter decay to quarks excludes the best fit uh, parameters required to explain the, the ISQ data, actually basically exclude the entire regions of one or two sigma, uh, maybe one sigma regions uh, required to explain the data. So this is why that decays into quarks, into soft channels, is in tension with gamma ray limits. However, and this is important to note, when we go to harder channels, actually uh, we have the, the neutrino limits are the best uh, limits uh, that uh, one can get better than gamma ray ones for relatively hard channels for masses about 100 TeV. And this is kind of a, a take home message. Uh, okay, so let me move on uh, because I'm running out of time. This is the six year analysis. This is for the, the, the dark matter decays into Ws. This is the best fit, but now we have no one sigma region here and all happens at the 100 TV regime. Now the dark matter uh, wants to explain, dark matter decays wants to explain the 100 TV regime. And that uh, requires also an astrophysical spectrum, which is very hard, which are uh, a power law index compatible with it through OMU example. And the region for this, the reason for this is that in these two extra years of data, there is no PV event, but only sub PV events, which contribute in this regime. And that is why dark matter uh, wants to explain that. Uh, that region. We have here also for hard channels, still we have uh, uh, the best fit at, uh, at the highest, uh, at the highest, uh, the highest masses, but also getting uh, more uh, confidence into the um, 100 TV region. Here I show you the different results, uh, similar things when we compare among uh, the four, six year analysis, and even when we compare with the four year analysis, everything stays within, let's say, a couple of seconds. We can get limits, and actually the limits are very similar with the, four, with the six year, uh, four year uh, results. So I will not say any, any further comment on this. And one can actually explain all the data uh, uh, along the lines of uh, uh, Serpico and uh, Smiley, and uh, trying to explain all the astrophysical data with only uh, dark matter. Uh, with two year data, that could be done. With four year data, we did that, and that could, could be done. With six year data, that could be done. But the problem with this is that we explain, to explain all the data, we need a dark matter of a mass of a 
PEB or for QPEB. And we need to explain the soft, the low energy data. And for that, we need a soft channel to contribute a lot. And actually you see 90%, 97% of the, of the branching ratio has to be into a, a very soft channel that produces too many photons. And that is in tension with gamma ray density. And just a few comments before I finish uh, on dark matter annihilations. Uh, one can also uh, uh, consider the possibility of explaining the data with annihilation instead of the case. And here, the dark matter signal from the galaxy depends on the square of the density, so it's more focused towards the galactic center. We have an extragalactic component, and here we have an uncertainty coming from a clustering factor that depends on how dark matter clusters and, and halos of different sizes at different, at different redshifts. And for that, we introduce a new parameter to gauge the contribution between the galaxy and the extra. Extra -galactic, and extra galactic contribution. One can do a back of the envelope uh, calculation that was also done in the first Tenebrae paper and realizes that one would need a very large annihilation cross section uh, to explain part of the data, which is above the unitarity limit and for, from this point of view, loses interest. But one can do a phenomenological analysis and this is what we did. We, we see that the, the best cases of this for the dark matter annihilations is in W bosons at uh, explaining the low energy data, 100 TeV, and you see qualitatively similar, uh, that in the case of, of the case, 100 TV, dark matter annihilation to explain this, and then we require astrophysical flux much uh, harder in agreement with the through one uh, result. But remember, in all this analysis, I'm not imposing any prior, prior coming from the through one sample. This comes naturally from the thesis sample. Uh, well, there is no significant stereolactic contribution that is needed, but this is not a big deal. These are the results, similar statements, but in any case, very, very large cross section, way above uh, the unitarity limit. Here are the, 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 the limits on the dark matter and so cross section. The unitarity limit is one or two orders of magnitude, at least uh, 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 below the, the values on, in these plots. Um, well, I, I will not comment on, on this because this is not that interesting. And I'm running out of time. This is just my last slide before the conclusions. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning that we have seven and a half years of HESI data, but it has, they, this data has modified selection cuts, which are non-public yet. So this is why we, we didn't use them. And, uh, but there are some preliminary analysis from the ice cube collaboration itself, and the results are uh, very similar to what I just showed you for, for six years of HESI with limits around 10 to the 28. Uh, seconds uh, for a, range, a large range of masses. So let me conclude in addition to, to be produced by a standard mechanism, high energy neutrinos could be produced by dark matter decays, maybe annihilations. An ice cube data is compatible yet with a contribution from dark matter decays. And actually dark matter decays could explain the hundred, the region around 100 TeV of the HESI data. And then we, have, we can have a hard astrophysical spec spectrum that explain the higher energy events in the HESI sample and that would be in full agreement of the through immune sample, which is also sensitive to the highest energy part of the spectrum. And then finally, uh, let me just stress that the neutrino data set the strongest limits on the dark matter lifetime for hard channels and masses around 100 TV or so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serge, for the very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions? I have just a curiosity. I'm very naive on, so, um, what does uh, how a different density profile might affect uh, your result? You the mean the dark matter density profile in the galaxy? Yeah. yeah. Um, little actually, we, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the distinct with the current data, uh, distinguishing a nice, a purely isotropic uh, signal from a signal with an isotropy associated to the, to a, for instance, dark matter decay is very hard with current statistics. It cannot be than at say more than it's definitely less than two sigma. So barring the, the astrophysics, the, the profile of the dark matter within the galaxy would simply add some fraction, uh, oh. a small difference with respect to the decay. And we cannot distinguish that dark matter decay from an, a purely isotropic yet. Okay. So are there any question or comment for this last talk? If uh, not, I would like to thank Sergio and all the speaker of the session. And I leave uh, the last comment to Katerina. Thank yes, you. Indeed. Thank you very much for uh, the, the session and for contributing with uh, both talks and questions. And uh, we are obviously not done with dark matter. 
and we'll have another uh, another session tomorrow morning, starting bright and early at uh, 8 a.m. in uh, uh, in European time. The session tomorrow will be uh, both the uh, kinds of WIMP dark matter experiments, results, interpretations, and also uh, sort of community uh, building. So it's an interesting session for for everyone. Uh, for tonight, uh, some of the speakers have uh, put up their Zoom link if uh, they want to be found and uh, they don't have anything else to do because it's kind of late as well in Europe. Uh, so you can click on the, on the talk and see if there's a Zoom link below that. And uh, if you, I will be around for uh, a little bit longer here in case there's any technical problems. Uh, but I think everyone who wanted to have their Zoom link up there's a link up, otherwise we can even keep this room open for a while. Uh, and with that, I hope I didn't forget anything, Sylvia. I guess. No? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, so thank you again, and uh, see you either in the, the rooms of the speakers or tomorrow morning. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.